morning. I'd like to welcome you all to the February 17th, 2022 Blue Ribbon Fisheries Advisory Council meeting. Um, in attendance this morning, we have uh, Rex Infanger, myself, Brian Anderson, uh, Chris Burston, Dave Buchanan. Uh, we have, uh, oh, Jordan was able to join us for part of it. Good. Larry Finch, Michael Christensen, Mickey Anderson, Natalie Boren, Nick Braithwaite, Randy Opplinger, our director from the DWR, uh, Rich uh, Lobervich, and Russ Lawrence. So, um, oh, and TJ, I sorry, I missed you. Um, I would. Uh, I, did all of you get the notes that I, I know? Uh, Lindy sent those out just a couple of days ago, but. I, she really did a marvelous job on getting us up to date on those January notes. I was, I was quite impressed. I couldn't see anything that that was missed. Did did anyone here see anything that was missed? I was going to um, say anything missed, but I, I received an email from Rich with uh, a couple comments that all got incorporated in there. Just some wording kind of things. If you would please, Randy. Yeah. Um, my name was missing. I was at that meeting. Sorry, I keep pushing the wrong buttons here, but yeah, I'll make sure you get out of TJ. Okay, thank you. Yeah, my name is missing as well. Okay. <clears throat> yeah, let's make sure that those get added. If we make those corrections, would anybody move that we accept those notes? So moved. Thank you, Larry. I appreciate that. Do I have a second? I'll second it. TJ. Okay, thank you. All right, then we will go forward from there. Um, I think uh, let's just go ahead. If there, if there's not anything else that we need to move up, let's go ahead and uh, Southeast region, uh, Cal or Jordan, are you taking the lead on this one? Whoever. Uh, is Cal on? I didn't see him, but I'll mute and let whoever take one of you take it. Yeah, I'll talk. I'll talk to you guys for a minute. So Cal was uh, potentially heading down to um, recapture to to get going with uh, northern pike spawn and check fish. So he called me a couple days ago. You want me to bring up just a couple of things uh you'll we'll, we'll be seeing proposals for uh coming up for huntington creek for the uh limiting factors analysis study that we want to do there that will kind of describe what kind of restoration we need to do on that creek going forward so we have a sustainable fish population and um he, he has a proposal coming up for the whole um small pond lake complex there by recapture uh with with i think he said some boat ramp additions and and some different management activities um so in addition to that i've got a proposal in that you guys will see that is uh looking for money to uh, modify schofield dam so we can get consistent winter flows through that dam uh, this year has been really challenging on on the winter flows uh, there's the the reservoir is low enough that right right now we rely on uh, cavitation leakage through cavitation damage in the gate, and we've only been getting about half a CFS on average, and uh, we're supposed to be getting two. Um, so we've proposed and the BOR has approved us putting a new low flow gate. We'll put in an eight inch gate and uh, push water through the air shaft of the of the dam, the BOR has reviewed all of this. We're just uh, looking for money to implement the, the infrastructure upgrade so we can keep water flowing. Um, so those are kind of the three things from Southeast region. Otherwise it's, it's winter. <laughs> uh, I see a lot of people ice fishing out at Schofield when I'm up there and uh, I'm assuming the fishing's doing okay, but I don't have any kind of report on that, so. But that's kind of all I have for Southeast region today. 
I, I noticed on the fishing report, Jordan, thank you very much, um, that it said that Schofield that folks had been getting fish if they were willing to walk out a little ways from shore. So I, evidently they are catching some. Did Cal mention a, I, I know they are still working on the access with the uh, CMW people. Uh, uh, do you know, if yeah, you, did you hear any update on that at all? Um, he said that they are working on some things, but he didn't have details that they were ready to share. So he, he, was, he said, they'll probably ask about this, but uh, don't, <laughs> don't say anything unless they bring it up. <laughs> and, and he said, even at that, like, we're working on some things, but we're, we're not ready to share anything on it yet. But it's moving forward at some point. Sounds like it. Yeah, I'm not in the middle of those negotiations at all, so um, so I don't know any details. Thank you. Hopefully, any questions? Hopefully we, can, hopefully we can walk up and down that whole stretch of Lower Fish Creek. Yeah, that's it's a great place to fish. It'd be nice to have access to all of it, so. Yeah, well, it's pretty. It's good fishing. It's close, so. <laughs> All of which are good things, right? Uh, sometimes. <laughs> yeah. All right. Any uh, questions for Jordan? Okay. Oh, looks uh, like Larry's got a hand up. Oh, Larry's got a hand up. Hey, Jordan. Just looking at the notes, uh, 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 we're leasing uh, water to come out of that dam. Uh, uh, it, is that water held in reserve? Could that be released later in the season since we're not releasing it now? Um, it doesn't really it, it doesn't really help the ecology of the of the stream to release it later in the season. What I've been doing is working with the river commissioner. I'm obligated to deliver a, a certain volume. Um, and so, since we can't, we prefer it to be a consistent flow. That's what's good for the winter or, or for the river during the winter. But since I can't get that, we've we've been doing some pulse releases so that we achieve the volumes that we're required to deliver for the funding agreements that I have. So, and, and I have to meet those uh, on a month by month basis. Thank you. If 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 we get into the irrigation season, it doesn't make any sense to release those during the irrigation season. It'll just get pulled. Um, into all the canal systems in price. Yeah, now I understand. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Thank, thank you, Jordan. Um, Nick, I think you are up next. If we could have the uh, southern region. Right. Yeah, um, there, there's not a whole lot to report. This is the time of year we're just doing meetings, project proposals, reports, that kind of stuff. Um, but in terms of conditions down here, um, all our high elevation lakes are still pretty well ice covered, Fish Lake, Panguitch Lake. Um, but our mid elevation lakes are starting to lose their ice like Otter Creek and Minersville. Um, so just be aware of that. Um, snowpack is, we started out really looking good, um, but we're starting to get worried. We're down below 100% in most places. Um, it's been a while since we had a good storm. Um, one thing I will mention that we're working on is we've got a few um, management plan committees going on. So these are committees where we have public groups getting together, coming up with recommendations. So one is on Boulder Mountain. So that is a Blue Ribbon area. This is a revision or kind of a review of a management plan that was put in place in 2014. So Dave's serving on that and, and Randy's been um, attending as well. It's going pretty smoothly. It's it's mostly just going to be kind of tweaks to the existing plan and updating the group on on what's been done since it was first written in 2014. And then I think I mentioned last time we're also doing a management plan for Navajo Lake. So it was treated in the fall. And um, so we're doing a, a management plan with the public committee to come up with a, a new plan there. And so that was one, Navajo was one I'd mentioned for as a potential focal water uh, to help get the dike replaced and maybe improve the boat launching there. Uh, so those are the main main things we're working on and, and the main update I have, if anyone has any questions. 
last time I was noticing in the notes, uh, you thought there might be a possibility of a flyover on Dead Lake, so we'd have some idea whether the new batteries that you were able to get, were you able to get anything to have any idea? No, I talked to Levi, who's our biologist over there, uh, our big game biologist, and he, they haven't done any flights. So I'll, I'll touch base with him again and let you guys know if I hear an update, but um, we may have to just wait till until um, we can actually get in there and take a look. But um, we won't have any meeting next month. Well, we'll have a joint meeting, but uh, so we won't be reviewing, I think, m much of this. But I was wondering, uh, typically, does the ice come off uh, those lakes? Is, is that a May event? Yeah, it, it can vary by year, but yeah, you're looking at later May especially up there may even into june i mean it's it's over ten thousand feet up there okay thank you yeah, very much you. no it didn't mean to cut you off nick so no I, no you're good Did i you have a got a new person at lake pal are they getting settled in i'm sorry i lost his name yeah so so dan keller's our, dan. our new so he's the project lead. So he replaced Wayne Gustavison. And so he's getting settled in. We had a work plan meeting yesterday um, where he kind of presented some of the thoughts he had. He's been reviewing data, developing a plan going forward. So he's, he's going to be great at Lake Powell. Um, and then they're going to be hiring a biologist who will work under Dan. And they're doing interviews for that next week, I think. So that'll be, be replacing George Bloomer if you knew him. But. So we should be fully staffed here in the next couple of weeks there. I, how say access it? I mean, where are we on being able to launch a boat? I, I got a picture the other day from Pal and it was, uh, I'm not even sure how you'd launch, but are there still places to launch? Yeah, so, so I think there are still places to launch um, and we're trying to work with National Park Service and figure out what we can do. It, it's going to be hard if if the water situation continues, but they're, you know, they're working on improving Bullfrog. It, it sounds like the existing ramp, basically there's a cliff after the existing ramp and you can't really extend it, but they're working on a, a ramp off to the side to, to the length of that so people can launch there. So it... It's being worked on, but yeah, it's going to be tough. Yeah, that was the picture that I got was the cliff at Bullfrog, and I, it definitely looked like uh, a, a very poor place to even try to launch. So, okay. Yeah, definitely. Um, thank you, Nick. Appreciate it. Mickey, have you got Central Region? I didn't see Chris on. Uh, no, I... I... Haven't heard anything. Uh, and Nick, I had one quick question about the perch fishing at Fish Lake. We're not hearing good reports at all. Is there? Have you heard anything of what's going on? Or no, I I haven't heard much. Um, I talked to somebody who went up there and said they did okay, but that they were probably more interested in lake trout. So yeah, um, yeah, that's actually that's pretty surprising to me. All, I mean, it's been so many years of just. We haven't seen anything in our nets to suggest the perch numbers would be significantly down in any way. Uh, so yeah, right. I, I'm not sure what that would be. Yeah, well, they probably just need better bait. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, you, you you do have to move around and find exactly where they are in the weeds sometimes, and then you can't keep them off. But. Yeah. All right. Thanks. And Rex, I haven't talked to Chris at all. I I don't have anything on Central Region. Or whoever is has Jackie, Jackie's replacement. We don't have Chris replacement. taking over for the uh, uh, as head biologist for the central region now. Or, or Chris what's is happening there? Sorry, Chris is technically the head biologist of the central region. He's been just filling in for Jackie. Um, we have not hired a Jackie replacement yet. I, I don't know if the job posting's out yet or not, but I, the intent is to hire somebody really soon. And I haven't heard anything from Chris. He didn't provide me any kind of updates to share, which sometimes he sends along. 
Okay. I, Mickey, I do know that uh, we have a meeting on the on the third of uh, doesn't affect or affect uh, Blue Ribbon, but we do have a meeting on on Utah Lake. There, <laughs> that that stirred up a bit of controversy down on Utah Lake this year with all that's happening in the legislature and stuff. So, but that was the last time I got to chat talk to Chris. So that's been two weeks. So. Yeah, just you're right. And that's probably the big thing coming out of that region right now is they're they're starting, just starting a management planning effort for Utah Lake. And I know Rex, you're involved with that. I'll be involved with that as well. But it's not going to get into the island kind of stuff, but more the fishery and access and things like that down the road. Yeah, I do know that I, I've reached out to Brady Brammer, that's my uh, representative, and uh, I know they're working on some things for Utah Lake at this point. So. That's that's all I know. It's not blue ribbon related, but uh, I, everything I've heard of ice fishing has been good at Strawberry, though. So I see. There's a couple hands. Clint and Ross. I think Clint's maybe first. Okay, Clint. Hey. So yeah, I think they posted that job of Jackie's last week. Um, I saw the announcement that they're hiring a sport fish biologist down there. So. Um, it should be relatively quickly that they have somebody else on board. Definitely by the time we meet y'all in Salt Lake, well, there'll probably be a virtual meeting, I guess, for Blue, the combined meeting for Blue Ribbon and Habitat, but um, they should have it done by then. So that with the announcement being last week. Russ, you had your hand up and then Larry, you've got yours. So is yours still up, Russ? Yeah, I just uh, would add what you what you said rex that that ice fishing has been very good at strawberry and uh you know that's no surprise really but uh but it's been a lot of fun yeah i had a friend that tried to hold it over my head that i was missing out on really good ice fishing I, considering where i am my sympathy meter really didn't move <laughs> <laughs> well we, we actually took four wheelers and we rode three miles uh, to where we were going to fish uh, from, from the marina and uh, and had a tent and it was plenty warm and comfortable and, and you know, short sleeves. So, you know, Rex, we can we you could wear that shirt if you'd like and we will take you out and <laughs> you know, make it a good time for you. Um, Larry, you had your hand up. Yeah, I was just going to say I, I was uh, with a couple of friends on uh, well, Wednesday evening and they had just come back from Strawberry and they, as they, their words, they killed it up there. So, Okay. Yeah, and I fished it and, and did really well. I did echo also in 50 feet. You couldn't keep the little perch off. Like an 8-inch perch is as fast as you could drop it down. I fished the middle Pro Bowl last week. Midges are really good. Midday, but big flies all day long. And then I fished the lower Sunday, and uh, that was really good with big flies as well. A really good mid hatch on the lower at around 3 to 3.30. There were There's a lot of fish out. Thank you. Um, Clint, I guess we're on to you. We're getting through this fairly rapidly. Randy, we may be able to, well, we've got Natalie, and we definitely want to have Plenty of time for her report. Looking forward to it. Yeah, and if we get done early, I've got maybe some details for next month's meeting that I could cover before lunch to take up a few Thanks. minutes. Thank you. Clint? All right. So um, kind of like everybody else, we're kind of wrapping up reports. I did want to touch base. Um, uh, the Cisco Disco was pretty boring. It sounded like as far as fish goes, they were about a week ahead of the um, spawn for the Cisco this year. Um, Shantae and I actually went up the following week and helped Scott um, collect uh, Cisco for his sample that he does every year to get his sex ratios and size. And um, we, he wants, he usually collects about a hundred fish and puts those through the um, through the process. So we went and did that. Um, Shantae probably caught a, I don't know. Uh, seven, eight pound lake trout. Scotty caught one about four pounds. I caught a white fish. Um, and that was about an hour and a half of fishing for those hundred Cisco and um, those three fish. So it was pretty good. 
Um, we tried a dip net. There was that morning they had come in on the shore. And so we tried a dip net. We got about, uh, about a quarter of what we needed. We got about 25, 27 fish, but they're, it was later in the morning. So they were kind of starting to move offshore. Um, Bear Lake has now been completely frozen. It's opened up, it's froze, it's opened up, I stranded some guys, um, probably seen stories or heard stories. Um, Scott was there when uh, it broke on the Cisco beach side and guys were swimming for shore, trying to get across from how it broke and came open. Um, having lived that experience on that exact body of water, I haven't ice fished it since. So um, it's a, it can be a spooky place. Um, they've had people that have, you know, fallen through and lost, you know, equipment and all kinds of stuff up there. So, um, but the South shore sounds like South shore has some pretty good solid ice. Um, it's nice that it's frozen. We may get a really good, um, production this year for off of our Cisco. Um, since it's been six years since it's completely frozen and like another three or four years before that, before since it had froze again. So it might, it might help us if we can get some good cold years like this, maybe to rebound. Um, I think Scott said this is year 21 of a decline um, on his hydroacoustics at Cisco. Um, and as you guys know, that's, a, that's main, one of the main forage fish for the lake trout and the cutthroat there. Um, so hopefully in coming years, we've made the change and got the adipose fin clip um, regulation removed at Bear Lake and so um, people have been taking those fish home, um, been really excited. They don't have to toss those back. So it's been a good thing. He's only heard good things about it. Nobody's cussing him out. So, um, they are doing, they're probably going to do a creel through the end of March, um, there as well, since it's froze, um, and see what the pressure is. Um, just in one day, he said it was probably four times the amount of boats that would be on the rock pile. There were 60 plus anglers sitting on the rock pile and there's usually only a you know handful of boats so it really increases the pressure um and and that's probably a good thing if, for for the cisco anyways um we're gonna have a discussion a little bit later today about pine view and access um like i said early on in to the group as we were getting this meeting started it's a little bit above my pay grade i may have spurred the conversation to get started but um I'm glad to see it, at least us being included in this conversation now. Um, Willard, uh, we will start spawn on the 9th of March and run till the 14th of April. We're going to run two different crews. This is just kind of some information. We're not looking for quotas. Randy can correct me if I miss anything, but I'll just say this right now. Um, I'm super excited about this. Um, as biologists, we've worked our butts off trying to get fish from nets to bins into the hands of our hatchery guys um, fast and efficient. And um, it hasn't worked the way that we wanted to. So um, maybe in some ways our complaints have been heard. Um, it gives us more work to do. Um, so that's a good thing, I guess. Um, but we're gonna be, we've got temp loggers out collecting temperature data right now, all the way through the end of the spawn. Um, that will be, that will coincide with some of the data that they collect on when females are the most ripe and, and they get the most eggs. Um, and then they're doing a study on size of females of stripping eggs and um, whether they're successful, the survival of those eggs in hatching. Um, and maybe their, their cutoff line right now is 20 inches or less will be one group. and and 20 and above will be another group. Um, we're gonna run one boat out of the region this year, um, run two to four nets. We have no quotas, we have no egg numbers to fulfill. Um, and it's all about trying to figure out how to get these fish that, um, these eggs that are collected to get them fertilized and to get them to survive. Um, one of the issues uh, additionally is that the eggs clump maybe more than um, other places throughout the U.S. Um, so they're looking at some different solutions um, and so different treatments. And that's going to be one of the other studies that they're doing this year um, to kind of benefit. Uh, FES will also be running an electrofishing boat in the evenings, one night a week. Um, 
and do the literature, they're like going to be shocking from 12 to three o'clock in the morning. And we've never went that late normally because we had to be up at six o'clock the next morning to go pick nets. So um, it'll be interesting to see what they find. Um, and like I said, so first, second week of March to the second week of April, we'll be running that spawn. Um, we're going to be normally we'll just be setting nets on Monday, pull on Tuesday, set Wednesday, pull Thursday. Um, we're going to run a crew, two different crews out of the region. In case somebody gets sick, we can kind of swap out. It's more of a concern on the hatchery side of things. They seemed a lot more concerned than, than we did, but we'll take the fish all the way back. Once we get the egg or once we get the fish, we're going to take them back to the bins, separate them. And then, um, we'll actually handle the fish. Um, as biologists, we'll squeeze uh, eggs and milk, get them fertilized, and we'll do the dirty side of all this work. And then the hatcheries will take those fertilized eggs um, and do the tests that they need to do. So hopefully um, we're going to be collecting a lot of different data. It's going to be a little bit um, tougher, but, you know, on the back of our minds, we've always wondered, is there a different shoreline that we should be setting these nets on, or is there a different location we should be targeting or a different depth or, you know, different substrate, whatever. Um, and a lot of those answers will be, hopefully, uh, a lot of those questions will be answered this, this spring. Um, and so Robert Shields is kind of putting that together and, and I'm, I'm super excited. Um, and then be really good if we can really kind of make a good charge and collect this data and be able to use it in the future and maybe only work our guts out for two weeks instead of spreading it out over six be able to collect the numbers of eggs and stuff that we need to. So, um, Randy. Yeah, all good comments, Clint. And that's, um, more than I knew for some of this stuff. So that that's good, but I will kind of back up and just provide just a little perspective. So we've been running the walleye program at Willard since I think 2016. So we're what five, five years of data, six years of data, something like that. Anyway, the point is, is over those years, um, the, the percentage of our eggs that hatch, they're down maybe about 20%, something like that, of the eggs that we take. Nationwide, you look at the percentage, it's more like 70%. So we are not doing as well as other states are doing. So the big impetus of this year is for us to take a step back and maybe evaluate our program, try some different things out and see if we can get it, you know, what's going on. So we can come back next year with maybe a, a more refined protocol that addresses uh, some issues and gets our egg hatch rates up. So that would make our program more efficient. And a lot of it's, we keep trying what other states recommend, but we're seeing some differences in how walleye perform in uh, Willard, particularly, you know, Clint brought up the egg clumping, for instance, some issues along those lines. So we're just taking this year as kind of an experimental year where we're less driven by getting a certain number of fish and more driven by just trying some stuff out to refine our protocol. Yeah, thanks, Randy. Um, just kind of for everybody else, I mean, I know that Natalie knows this because she's come and played on the boats with us. So um, typically we're running 16 nets and two boats. Um, so we're reducing our nets, you know, by quite a, by quite a few and to run two to four. Um, Cody and I were on a boat numerous days, just him and I picking nets, um, doing eight nets by, you know, 10, 11 o'clock in the morning. So um our the one big concern that I don't know if how it's going to work is with it being as shallow as is we're we're missing a half a lake right now in Willard. Um, we're down below the rip rap and out onto the gravel flats below those. Um, so kind of we're all kind of a little nervous of what our bycatch may be as temperatures increase and some of those things and how that will affect us. Um, also a reason why we're kind of running low numbers of nets. Um, and, but like I said, it's, it's a going to be, it's going to be a learning year. Um, and hopefully, you know, we can, we can really kind of get some things pounded out and, and figured out. Um, maybe with the way Willard was built sitting on all this clay and everything on the great salt Lake floor, um, it has some chemistry issues that make that egg clumping a little bit more, um, tough. I don't know. Um, it's just, just some cool things that we're trying to figure out. Um, and I'm excited to see if we can pound through it and, and make it work. Um, as far as the rest of the things go, um, had a, uh, ice fishing tournament on East Canyon and Lost Creek after this meeting, it was a two day event. 
um, only about 60 guys participated, um, or I had about 60 guys on a list. Um, I was doing weights for um, the Sunday portion. Um, and the big fish from Lost Creek was like 19 inches. The big fish from uh, East Canyon was 19 inches. Um, but they had them kind of broken up and in, into different areas um, and they had to be checked in by us. They were not allowed to fish in tents, um, but I think all, overall it was pretty good. Um, and then they had another one just at um, Rockport that was the ice addiction one. And the fish that won there was a big Utah sucker. Um, so uh, then as far as the river stuff, um, the Weaver, I've only got one report. I was really hoping to get out there the last week, but I didn't make it. So um, I've got one report and they caught a few fish. Um, our, our flows are super, super, super low. They're way skinny. Um, just like what we get from Rockport that re or from Lost Creek um, downstream and Como Springs dumping in, there's not a lot of water that comes down through once you get below echo. So um, we're trying to work on some of that stuff and plan for a sampling effort between the reservoirs, um, probably May and June, depending on runoff and water clarity and those kinds of things. So um, it should be really good fishing, but I haven't, I haven't got there. And we're trying to work with, um, I'm trying to work with some, landowners to get some access so we can do some work there but um anyways that's what i have for the report mickey what you got so is the uh, river still frozen between the reservoirs between rockport and echo do you know uh i want to say that there's probably a little bit of open water i'm trying to remember the last time i was up there um I want to That's say the, that I know yeah, it's like, change, so yeah, it it looked pretty frozen, other than like some of the riffles, you know, some of those moving riffle portions. The pools, the last time I or like when I went by, and it's been a week and a half, probably almost two weeks ago that I like that I was up there looking, um, and we were looking at some fence crossovers because um, one of the groups, one of the fly fishing groups wants to replace the wood ones with metal ones, but we have to work through some hoops um, through the easement stuff in order to do that. So, and at that point, I don't think you could have fished very much. It looked pretty frozen to me, um, but I haven't fished that upper stuff other than when I was working on the projects, I'd fish in between the guys turning dirt and me planting willows. I'd grab a fly rod and fish for a little bit. So, but I, I think, at least two weeks ago, you couldn't fish very much between the reservoirs. Thanks. Um, Russ says that uh, Lost Creek hasn't been like on fire, but it's been pretty good. And and guys were catching fish and seeing fish that day, but they they I don't know if it was just increased pressure on the ice or what the deal was, but it was a little off that Sunday for the tournament. So, Larry. Yeah, I was just going back to the notes. Have you set a date to put out the uh, structures for Rockport and Echo uh, uh, this spring? No, no, Sorno and I haven't discussed that. We have a, um, Cody Edwards has accepted a job with the Forest Service, and so he's leaving. Um, he's been our flat water guy and kind of putting, you know, the two of them have kind of been working together doing that, so. Um, we haven't, we don't have a date set yet. My guess is it probably will not be until an April, end of April, first part of May timeframe would be my guess is when we got, we've got all the structures, all the habitat at the office. We just, I don't know if we're gonna try to do a little assembly prior to that or not, um, but I have, we haven't said anything, but I can put that in some notes and, and talk to Sorrel and see when he wants to do it. And I can get back to the group and, and let you know. Yeah, let, let me know. I'd love to come out and help. Okay. Thanks, Larry. Rex. 
Yeah, that was going to be my comment. Of I, well, if you could kind of give us a heads up, uh, it'd be something that, especially with the little water we have this year, might be a good thing to be able to go out. And I, I know I'd like to be involved if I could. Okay. You'll leave Hawaii to come and help put in structures, huh? No, uh, I have to come home on the 28th. <laughs> <laughs> I got you. Um, so one other thing that we kind of been thinking, I, and I know that it's um, two meetings or a meeting past at least, um, we talked about focal waters. Um, and since we're talking about structures and habitat, my I wanted to bring it up to the group. Um, Russ and I kind of talked about it a little bit this morning. Um, so we've been asking Blue Ribbon and Habitat for about 15 grand a year to put in these structures. Kind of, and I don't want to say it's piecemealing it along, but um, it's kind of what we can do in in the region in a couple of days to to get some of this stuff put together. I think what we may come back with um, in the next few years, depending on who takes this flat water job and and kind of change in management and those kinds of things. Um, I think we may come to Blue Ribbon asking for and and Habitat Council asking for seventy five or one hundred thousand dollars and focus maybe say you know we're going to focus some effort on a specific body of water whether it's willard or pine view or echo and rockport together um, but we would like to maybe put a bunch of structures in one year in one water maybe cover two or three football fields which really doesn't end up being a whole lot when you're on on the lake but um when you get down to the skinniness of we that we were at like eight percent at Echo, and you have three three or four football fields of habitat that that young year age class can get into, that makes a big difference. And uh, so, just to kind of let you know that even though I didn't say we were going to focus on a specific body of water for this year or year's proposals or whatever, um, in the next couple of years the council may see that coming from the Northern region um, as a big push to like keep age classes of this young year perch and crappies coming through the system year after year um, and maybe make a bigger impact. And we probably set a crew out for a whole week on, on the shore of whatever reservoir it is and just build structures for four or five days straight and place them and uh, hopefully um, make a good, make a good impact. Um, in some of those areas. So the deepest right now at Pine View is 36 feet that I found. Um, and that's claiming that it's come up like seven or eight feet, which I am really struggling to see that it's even come up a foot, but um, it makes a big difference when we're, when we're this kind of, in, in these kinds of situations and it really can save some fish. So, um, that's all I, that, that's kind of one of the last things I wanted to share with the group is that was something that if you think that that would be doable, like I said, it'd be split between Habitat and Blue Ribbon and we'd probably get some other partners and the Rocky Mountain Anglers and some of those other groups to put in some time and effort and, and even some money too. But just thought I'd let you know and kind of put that on, on the books, so to say. Thank you, Clint. Um, yeah, that's that my with the water conditions we're looking at, that might be something to really take a look at. And we'll have to certainly bring it up and take a look at. Uh, one of the things you mentioned was drought conditions and I and I don't have it on the schedule, but um, and I want to give Natalie all the time we have, can. So I think Natalie will move on to uh, you with the Northeast region report, and then go right into the starv starvation bioenergetics report, if that's all right with you. Yep, that's exactly how I have it planned. And I wasn't gonna do a whole lot of regional report stuff, but I will run through a couple things real quick. Um, we do have two management plan team meetings coming up at the end of the month. The starvation management team meeting is on March 2nd in the evening and it's all virtual. And we also have the Pelican Lake management team meeting uh, February 28th in the evening, all virtual as well. 
And we're going to hold off on our Red Fleet team meeting this year. Um, we might send out kind of an update, but we're going to end up. We also have a vacancy in our region. Our uh, Ryan's partner up, partner in crime up at Flaming Gorge, Lowell, has retired now. And he's working on getting the job announcement out. But the new Lowell will actually be taking over the management of Red Fleet Reservoir along with the management team. Um, as I kind of mentioned last week, I got a new title in the region, which 10% of my workload is supposed to work on water rights now. And I don't know how I'm going to squeeze it in, but that's one of the ways that we're going to do that is by handing off one of the management teams and the management itself of Red Fleet to the new Lowell. So that'll kind of be a change in our region, but it'll be a good change to allow them to focus on it while I don't have quite so much time to focus on it anymore. So those are coming up. Um, Ice addiction, we had that tournament, like Clint said, we had that at Star or Steinecker this couple weeks ago, February 5th. We had 650 participants. Um, it worked out pretty well, as you guys know, with ice addiction. It's very um, limited on logistics. The parking is a hot mess most of the time. Getting people to the locations is a hot mess, but people caught fish. We had 150 weighed in during the tournament. Um, people had fun so we're happy to support that tournament and it brings a lot of new faces to the ice in our region so that one's great um pelican lake i just wanted to kind of give you guys an update on what we're seeing out there right now yeah rex sorry got on mute i do they catch a lot of the smaller walleyes that you'd like to get it was that more out of the lake it was at Steinecker, sorry, not starvation. Oh, it's, oh I'm yeah. sorry. That was my fault. But no, in the past, they haven't. <laughs> um, Pelican ice fishing update. So a couple of weeks back, we had a couple anglers go out and actually do really well on Pelican as far as bass. Um, but they also started catching carp through the ice. So last week, I myself went out and tried to catch carp through the ice to see if I could be kind of consistent at it. Um, and we were fairly consistent at catching carp through the ice. We had days where we could catch uh, five to 10 in a four hour ice fishing period, along with some really awesome bass fishing. So one thing I'm gonna do is be promoting a lot of different ideas to help assist me with carp removal and carp control for the long term out of Pelican Lake. And some things that we're working on with Randy are a, a reward tag program for carp removal at Pelican Lake. We're also working on bow fishing tournaments and we're gonna be working on a couple different carp removal style tournaments that may end up kind of looking like the burbot bash in the long run. Um, we're still working out all the details on that, but I basically cannot be the sole person who attempts to remove carp for eternity there with an electro fishing boat for two weeks every spring. I just, it's not gonna work out well. And I am not prepared to roll over on Pelican Lake and just let carp take over. It's not an option in my playbook. So we'll be doing a lot of different things with that and the Pelican Lake management team will have quite a bit of involvement in how we move forward with Pelican Lake into the future. But if you are looking for ice bass, uh, Trina caught about a four and a half pounder and I caught a three and a half pound, just beautiful bass through the ice, along with really good numbers of 10 to 12 inch bass coming through right now. So it has been very fun in the last few weeks. I don't know how long this ice will hold up there, but if you can make it out, now is a spectacular time. And call me before you do so I can give you specifics of where to go and what depths because they're pretty specific. So that's Pelican Lake. I rode into Diamond Mountain Lakes last week on the snowmobiles, um, checked the O levels at Mount Warner and Calder. They are very low. We are gonna be cracking the head gate today or tomorrow to see if we can get some of that bad water flowing out and keep at least one of those fisheries in better condition than what it is. But it's the typical Diamond Mountain Lake scenario where we have very low water and very low oxygen levels. And somehow those fish are adapting, um, especially at Calder. I was still able to catch plenty of fish at Calder in two milligrams per liter of oxygen. So it's unbelievable what those fish can adapt to and we'll try to do our best to keep them alive. And then, I'm just gonna jump into the starvation PowerPoint right now. So let me share um, share a window here. 
figure out how to share my PowerPoint. <clears throat> We're just going to share my screen. Can you guys see that? No, we can't, Natalie. How about now? No, that's still a no. Interesting. Maybe the third time is a charm. It looks like it's doing something this time. Okay, let me know when you see a PowerPoint slide. Yeah, we can see it. You can see it now? Okay. So, as you all know, we've been working on starvation bioenergetics project for about two years now. Our sampling started in basically June of 2020 and ended in November of 2021. Um, I could not have done this without Skylar Wolf from FES. And then with you guys' help and funding support, we uh, hired one of my technicians, Ben Vasquez, who worked for me for nine months on this project. And with those blue ribbon funds, I know sometimes it sounds like personnel is not the best use of money to fund through, uh, through Blue Ribbon, but there's no way I could have done this without Ben on staff full-time working on this project full-time. So I just wanted to put that out there. It's been a ton of work, but I think you guys will uh, be able to see what a year and a half worth of work looks like on paper, and the, some of the results we get are pretty incredible. So I'm going to jump right in, and I'm not going to share this full screen as far as through the presentation. I'll just click from slide to slide here. So you should see a population estimate recap slide um, up on the screen. You guys all see that? I can't see you anymore, so you'll have to tell me. Yes, we can see that. Perfect. Okay, so I want to go through the population estimates. Uh, everything about the project is pretty much a ton of work, and especially population estimates. So this first one was done for smallmouth bass, and it was completed in June. Um, the estimate for smallmouth bass in starvation reservoir was much lower than I would have ever guessed. But for age two plus smallmouth bass in starvation, we have approximately 2,341. And there's a variance around there, so there could be you know plus or minus on that. But they inhabit very specific habitat, um, rock slides, boulders. Um, sometimes they'll move into some of the littoral habitat to spawn, but for the most part, we have a pretty small population of smallmouth bass in Starvation Reservoir. Uh, following up with that, in June of 2021, we completed the walleye um, smallmouth or the walleye estimate. So, in 2021, in the starvation system, we have right around 10,300 walleye that are approximately eight to 12 inches. We have 4,745 walleye that are 12 inches and larger. And then we add in these age one walleye. So total approximate abundance of around 15,000 walleye that are age two plus. When we add in the one plus or the one age one walleye, we get about 22,000 overall walleye in the system. Now we've only done about three population estimates, maybe four in the last 30 years at starvation. Um, this estimate compared to those is Pretty, pretty significantly higher. Um, the most recent one was completed in 2014 by just our regional crew, and that was about 13,000 walleye. So overall, um, it looks like we're up about 7,000 walleye from the last population estimate. Um, it's really hard to pinpoint, though, with only three or four of these estimates done throughout the last 30 years, uh, how how it's fluctuated, we can't really say that this is an all-time high for the amount of walleye in the starvation system. But we can say it's the highest that we've um, obtained in the population estimates that we've done. So that's a recap of that. I'm going to move into smallmouth bass aging growth. And now we've broken this bioenergetics project down into three different parts, basically, where we're looking at smallmouth bass, walleye, and then the forage component to all this as well. Um, rainbow are in the mix, and I'll show you how kind of as we go through this, but 
This is a smallmouth bass age and growth chart. And this is kind of a comparison also with the rest of the United States um, smallmouth bass populations. So over here on this left side, we have the age of the fish. We have a mean length in millimeters right here. And I know it's not um, convenient to have millimeters, but we work in the scientific language and just realize kind of down here that age at quality length is about um, 280 millimeters or 11 inches, and that's highlighted at age four. So on the right, you can see the growth curve and you can kind of go up through the ages on the right, um, on the bottom axis, and then total length is on the, the vertical axis. So you can kind of pinpoint if you caught this size of a fish in 2021, um, it was about this age. And then we're gonna look at kind of some growth percentages here over on the right side of this um, spreadsheet. So I have to have Skylar explain this to me often because I don't use growth percentages a whole lot in the work that I do. But basically at, at age two, our smallmouth bass in starvation reservoir are growing greater than 75% of other populations in the United States. And that's how that can be interpreted, interpreted all the way down. So we get really pretty decent growth in our first few years. And then as we get older, we taper off. Um, the oldest age fish that we had come out of starvation reservoir was 12 years old. So there's an entire smallmouth bass paper that was accepted to two professional journals. Um, we just got done with the revisions and that basically goes through everything we learned about smallmouth bass at Starvation Reservoir. So when that is finished 100% and published, I will send Rex or Randy a link to that and he can send it out to the entire group because there's an entire paper now written on smallmouth bass at Starvation Reservoir. So I'm not gonna hit on much more besides some management implications at the end. Um, I'm gonna jump right into walleye aging growth and the same kind of chart here um, exists. So on the, the left hand side of the screen, you'll see kind of our comparison and then an actual comparison with how our walleye grow at starvation compared to walleye in Kansas, Virginia, and Wisconsin. Um, and on this one, I've included inches for you guys so you can kind of convert it. But at age one, we have, you know, a seven, almost eight inch walleye. At age six, we have almost a 17 inch walleye. At age 10, a 22 inch walleye. And then here's our growth percentages again. And same thing, you know, at age three, our walleye in starvation are only growing about 10% um, above where the rest of the walleye in the United States are growing. And I'll hit on this many times throughout the presentation, but we basically are running into a wall here at this age three size class. Um, it jumps back up after that, which is great, but you can see kind of this comparison with Kansas, Virginia, Wisconsin, um, and temperature, elevation, forage, all things play into this, but um, it's kind of interesting how our walleye compare and I don't know exactly why they don't have any more ages past seven for some of those states, but you can kind of see. And same thing over here. If you were to go out and catch a walleye that was, you know, 550 millimeters, you could pretty effectively say that that's a nine to, well, an eight to 10 year old fish kind of falls in that, that growth rate right there. So any questions on growth of walleye and bass in the starvation at this point? I know this is a lot to digest, but it's biology. Okay, I'll move on to another pretty cool thing that we found out, cool and eye-opening at the same time. So one of the big portions of the bioenergetics project is to figure out total consumption of prey by our walleye population and our smallmouth bass population. I'm gonna focus solely on walleye right now. Um, in this chart is age across the top and then prey item on the left-hand side in orange. So this is just for walleye at Starvation Reservoir. And again, we're working in kilograms here and I know it's a pain and it doesn't really relate, but I've kind of broken some out at the end. But 
let's just look at our small walleye. So we're looking age one, two, three walleye in the starvation system. So right now, as you go through this chart, you can see that they eat so many kilograms of crayfish per year. They eat a lot of aquatic invertebrates every year. They eat terrestrial invertebrates, not so much, but you wouldn't expect a walleye to come up to the surface and pick off a, a dragonfly. I just, it's not what they do. Zooplankton, they eat a ton of zooplankton. And then fish, obviously they're an apex predator, but we've got age one, two, three, and four taking out a ton of fish in this system. And over here on the right is your total in kilograms. So you can see throughout one single season, and remember that's one, one year, walleye in the starvation system eat this much forage. Now I'll break that down for you a little bit easier to, to understand and digest. So age one through 10 walleye are consuming approximately 36 metric tons of forage annually. One metric ton is 2,200 pounds. So that's 7,000 or 74,936 pounds of forage eaten in starvation reservoir just by walleye in a single year. And here's another breakdown. It's 26,000 pounds of fish per year. And then even further, how many perch so this is just from um, July through October, while I eat approximately 200,000 perch. And this is probably age, I mean, I guess we can't really break it down to say it's young of year through age five perch. We didn't go to that extreme, but it's a lot of perch. Um, breaking it down even further. So one of our management actions was to take 5,000 of our 10 inch rainbows and stock them in the spring at three inches. Um, we currently stock 185,000 of those every spring and approximately 157,000 of those are eaten by walleye between April and June, which is pretty incredible. And then we also know that walleye and starvation uh, rely heavily on our big 10 inch stalker rainbows as forage. So these fish go in in November, right about the 1st of November, and 55,000 of them are stocked at multiple ramps that they can get to each year. Those, out of those 55,000, approximately 5,000 of those are consumed by walleye in this system. So when you look at the big picture perspective, walleye eat a lot, and they continue to eat a lot throughout the entire season. So like I just said, they eat a lot, and here's some of the kind of summary items. Currently, this population would greatly benefit from a reduction in density, particularly the smaller individuals. And like I said, those eight to 12 inch walleye, they are pretty well stacked up in the system right now. Um, we should definitely continue to work on improvement of forage base and abundance and diversity in starvation reservoir. And that's one of our big management plan goals to begin with when we first came in. Um, smallmouth bass, the population is generally performing very well in starvation. And it's really thermal conditions that are our biggest limitation for growth in this fishery. We know rainbow trout are both an important sport fish, but they also are a very important forage fish. So we see good growth and we know that we have good return to the creel on our uh, rainbow trout. So basically, we're just going to continue to do what we do and stock those 55,000 10 inch fish in the late fall and continue to stock those 185,000 three inch rainbows each spring. Now, some of our next steps I told you we had the management team meeting coming up. We are going to spend quite a bit of time discussing regulation changes for both walleye and forage fish. And we don't have anything set in stone right now. Go ahead. I can't see who raised their hand. I, Natalie, it was me. I just wondered, I, are there other forage fish that you're looking at? Yeah, so since the beginning, we've tried several different things. Um, black crappie has been an addition to the reservoir as a, as a forage fish, um, and they're starting to, to come along. We've seen a little bit of natural reproduction from them. We've also tried kokanee salmon, and we stocked... 80,000 three inch kokanee salmon in the spring. But now that we know what happened to 185,000 
three inch rainbows, um, kokanee salmon will likely be discontinued because we have really not seen any return to creel. They basically all just get demolished by, um, by walleye in the spring. So that's one thing, that, and we can't really get a consistent um, stocking. There's many a times where Ryan was short on his um, kokanee stocking at the gorge where those are really needed. So we've elected to take our quota of 80,000 kokanee and put them in Flaming Gorge. So right now it makes sense to discontinue that attempt. Um, we also had mountain whitefish as a forage at one point on our management team agenda for forage, but our source of mountain whitefish is uh, whirling disease positive. So we haven't moved mountain whitefish at all in this system. And then the last kind of a big ticket item for trying to increase forage would be a round tail chub population that we're trying to get going. But our natives crews having some difficulties developing a brood stock of that in our region. So it's still many years out for, for that. But those are the forage options that we have pursued thus far. Um, crappie seem to be the probably the best option right now at potentially reproducing and providing some of that forage. And then our rainbow trout are, are critical to this walleye population in my mind. So those are the things we've done. Um, jumping back into this slide here. So our focus is gonna come back to forage. We are going to plan to transfer some more uh, black crappie adults from Pineview to starvation in May, and Trenna will be the lead on that project. Um, if funding allows, we'll continue to stock 72,000 three-inch black crappie uh, that come in from out of state uh, from 2022 to 2024. So we'll keep that in our toolbox as well. And then we're gonna plan and implement starvation reservoir forage fish habitat enhancement, and this is a phase one. And I'll hit on this in just a second. And then we're gonna to continue to refine our sampling efforts at starvation reservoir, monitor our region regulation changes as we move into the future. So last but not least, we're gonna work on this forage enhancement project. And this is in our WRI database project 5963. You guys will see this next month. But basically this is purchasing and installing prefabricated structures. Um, the ideal structures are these a slew of honey hole, mega nurseries, nursery habitat, shrub and trees. Before our management team meeting, I'll be meeting with a group to try to get uh, permission basically to add a couple of these structures to the MOU um, for habitat structures in the state of Utah. So we'll be seeing if they will grant us approval to try these nursery structures. These are new, made from honey hole, and these are specifically designed to protect fry and young of your fish. You can see those predators cannot get through that box, basically, on the outside where they can hide. These are shallow water structures, so this is another thing that we have to iron out with the Bureau of Reclamation is getting approval to put these in shallow water, because right now our MOU states that we have to put these 10 feet below the 10 year average low water mark in a system. And it, that just doesn't jive with how we want to protect these young of your fish in starvation. So somewhat experimental and we will definitely need help building and installing these when everything comes down to the wire. And that'll be a next fall installation. And like I said in the beginning, we definitely could not have done this project without Skyler's help, Robert's help from Fisheries Experiment Station, Ben's help, um, aquatic staff throughout the whole entire state helped out on this project. And I'm definitely thankful for everyone who contributed. And then some of our management team members, Ben Kurtz obviously spends a ton of time out there and he helped us with numerous, numerous diet collections. So that is basically a quick rundown. Um, I could obviously talk for hours on this and so could Skylar because there's so much data that was was gained from this project. But if you want to participate in the management team at the end of the month, I mean, we're going to spend three hours going through 30 slides and talking regulations and talking options at the end of the month. So 
If you guys have questions, I guess we have plenty of time to answer them. Hey, Natalie. This is yep. Hey, um, I, you're at least on our side, and and maybe it's because we have so much additional boat traffic. Um, Bor and Weaver Basin have really been super picky on what we can use. Um, and and you're right, like they they don't want anything close to the surface, anything that can be exposed. Um, and so that means that we're target. You know, we targeted. In the last several years, we were targeting stuff that was 50, 60 feet deep, that this year was only 15 feet under the surface of the water, um, like in Pineview this year. So I hope that you have different management there that will allow you to do it because it'd be really cool to have some places for those perch to spawn, um, especially if that's something that you've identified as, as a big bottleneck there. That was kind of one of my thoughts as you were giving your presentation as some habitat, if you could get some survival on some of those little fish. Um, but I don't know how much starvation fluctuates. It's a pretty big body of water, but uh, we've, we've really struggled. We've really, really struggled trying to get approval to put structures even in 50, 60 feet of water um, after they're spawned and hatched and everything. So hopefully yep. you have a lot better system there than we've, than we've had here. And I think it's just due to pressure on boats and traffic that we have. Yep, I will do my best to try to sell this to BOR and state parks. And yes, we do have fluctuation there, but it's our most stable reservoir in the region. Um, I mean, we fluctuated from 100 to 72%, I believe, or 69% this year. It's one of our biggest fluctuations. Normally, though, it's our most stable lake. So I'll do my best to try to sell this and hopefully we can monitor it well into the future. Uh, we'll see how it all plays out. If I get the denial from them, then so be it. And we'll do what we can with other options that are in the toolbox, but we'll just have to see. Um, I don't know who was first. Russ, you have your hand up. Yeah, Natalie, uh, I, I uh, enjoyed that uh, presentation and, and uh, it's very insightful. Um, those structures, uh, the the ones that are you know more box like mesh everything do you have to worry about maintenance for those kinds of structures with the uh, mosses or the other things you know uh, surrounding them so they don't become usable i'm sure we will have to worry about maintenance on those types of structures but my hope is that we could work with the state parks group at starvation and find you know one of those back bays with a gradual slope I've identified some areas I want to work in, um, but my hope is to find a place like that to where we could like completely block off with, you know, slow, no wake buoys, something like that, just to, to have that area as our experimental area and see what these structures are gonna do. Like they're going to be, the nature of the beast that we deal with as far as water fluctuations, they're going to go from being in the water at the time we need them in the water to eventually becoming exposed and then back underwater again as the reservoir fills again in the winter in the spring but i have no other way to try to deal with irrigation drawdowns like we experience besides just trying a project like this and seeing what happens because where these project or where these structures are used Back east, um, Midwest, they don't deal with what we deal with out here. Um, and it's complex, it's it's tricky. So yeah, we're probably gonna have maintenance issues. We'll see how it all plays out. First off, I gotta get approval and then we'll go from there. Yeah, but it does seem like an opportunity as well with the drawdown, cause then you could actually, you know, uh, yep. take a, you know, a power washer or something to them and, and uh, spruce them up. Yep. I don't know, did someone else have a question or a comment? Natalie, this is Rex. Um, I, when you asked, did we have any questions uh, on, on your two charts on the smallmouth and the walleye, that is, an amazing amount of work. I, I, it wasn't that I didn't have questions. I just 
was amazed by what you guys have done. I, this is a great study. Thank you. I, I honest, wow. Um, yeah, it is pretty wow. Like when I dove into looking through all the data that Skyler had put together, like, yeah, it's one thing publishing a paper on smallmouth bass, but we just completed the actual report. I think he's just tweaking it and it's 46 pages of all this stuff down to the T, you know, like very involved, very in depth. Um, couldn't have done it without him, but it's quite the project and I'm, th I'm thankful that we were able to do it. I think we were able to do it at a good time, but I want to point out one of the crazy things is so back in 2000, I guess 1999 through 2002, USU did the same really in-depth project. Um, we may have taken it to a different level as far as the amount of data and diet data we collected. But I started looking back at old starvation reports and I called Ray and I called George up and I said, what did this look like back in that day? You know, And trying to wrap my mind around how 30 years has played out at Starvation Reservoir. And the craziest thing to me is we are almost at that point again where USU re requested a, a recommendation basically of manual removal of small walleye because they had completely extirpated the, the population of Utah chub in that fishery. Well, we're to the point where we have an overabundance of small walleye in this fishery. They are not just, I mean, there's some forage left. There's forage in the system, but they take out so much of it that we haven't seen a perch year, like a really good perch fishing year even, or have them come back in seven or eight years now. So what I'm trying to avoid with the management plan, the regulations, I'm trying to avoid us going in and doing this manual removal of walleye from the system. I absolutely do not want to do that. I wanna have our anglers be able to go in and harvest these small fish, take them home and utilize them while thinning that population out. And also we're gonna to try to protect some of our brood forage fish species a little bit better. So in the big picture, we are almost back to exactly where we were in 2002. And it's crazy to think about that, that that can happen like it has, but that's how we, that's where we are. And it's pretty wild to think about. Dave? Natalie, I'm just curious back to the structures. Uh... It looks to me like those cage structures work very well, but it, uh, I can see them mossing up very quickly, probably within months. Is there any, have you looked at any, or is there any available, some kind of floating structure that could hang vertically down that would go up and down with the fluctuation of the water and put in certain depths that would be able to be towed back to the boat ramp, washed off and put back in places? I mean, boat, boat docks and uh, maybe the tires down to bullfrog for water breaks. They're all very good structures that float and they, they do the job as, as a place for fish to hide also. Is there anything like that available on the market? There is. Um, and I don't think that Pond King, like Pond King is the big structure habitat production place that we look at and they're very new and innovative, but they have these floating island type things that they've created in Texas lakes. Um, I'm not 100% sure how they, they're they built, but they're like, a, they're like a float, and then they actually have vegetation growing on the top, but everything underneath they have is kind of a, a hanging structure that comes down off of them. And I've thought about them before, and I do think they would be a really cool thing to try, but man, going and building them. I don't think there's an actual like prefabricated product that you can buy. I think this is something that you would try to build with small floats or something. I've seen them before and I've definitely thought about them, but in an attempt to build them, I have not even thought about how to conquer. Clint? So Dave, you ask a good question. We've, uh, uh, this year we'll install some for centrarchids underneath boat docks. Uh, I believe they're made by Mossback, if um, if memory serves me. Um, but uh, we've installed several, helped state parks install several boat docks. Um, 
specifically for anglers um, and have these hanging off, but we're also starting to use them where they have their docks close to the boat ramps um, to see if we can encourage bluegills to uh, maybe feed on any villagers from zebra or quagga mussels that may come in. Um, it's something being used. So for, I think I think it's moss back that makes those, um, Natalie, but um, we're looking at some, but you're right. It's, it's a heck of an effort to find something you can make work and, and do it for a long enough time so that those eggs can hatch and fry can get out of them, you know, to make that work. And the other thing is, is, you know, you have probably some pretty significant winds. You'd have to find places that, you know, maybe not have a floating structure get blown all the way up onto shore and, you know, you erase all of your efforts of trying to keep some of those little fish alive or whatever too. So, um, but, but bravo for looking at new ways of trying to get things, Natalie. It's, it's a heck of a, an investment for sure, but we really like the moss back and uh, your other one that slips my mind right now. All I can think is Pond King, but um, those two, the shrubs and trees and then uh, moss back structures, I've really liked. They don't seem like they're very trashy, um, but make sure when you write your grant proposal, not your grant proposal, but your uh, RFP um, that or RQS that you specifically like label those structures because we had a little bidder come in that seemed pretty similar. Sorno didn't want it and Salt Lake would not reverse that decision. And we have some really crappy structures that we're gonna have to deal with putting in. So be very specific on things that you um, label when you start to put your um, proposals out for bids and things. Absolutely, thanks Clint. Rex. Natalie, I was wondering, um, in oyster aquaculture, there's some big floating platforms and stuff that they use with the bags ha hanging down. I just wondered if there was something there that could be modified that, uh, because those are in commercial use. So they're generally, I mean, it's something that's, you know, commercially available for o oyster aquaculture that maybe that would be a place to, to take a look. And then my second, I had a question about, are there any other four, would any of the shads work in starvation? I'm sure that we could, I'm sure they would work. The problem is we have to follow what's on the white list of approved fishes okay. because it has a direct connection with the oh. endangered fish program in the Colorado River program. So okay. we are, we are limited to what we can and can't do with starvation reservoir as far as a forage. I mean, we would love to have shiners and shad and an abundant, you know, source, but, you know, there's a couple other things that are important to that system. Like we don't ever talk about flannel mouth sucker, but flannel mouth sucker have been entrained in that system since the dam was built. And they are doing phenomenal in that system in the face of predators that are, I mean, looking to wipe them out consistently. So there's also things we have to think about as far as, you know, that's not an, a threatened fish, but it's a native fish. And we want to make sure that we're not going to add something that would be detrimental to that population who has somehow figured out how to escape walleye and be successful at recruiting every year for the last 50 years. So there's a lot to think about. And we have some options on the table still, but we are really limited to what we can do in that system based on what the recovery program will let us do. I, the only reason I thought, Shad, is that maybe with them already being in PAL, uh, I just, that was a reason, but thank you. I wish, man, I wish. Some things should be easier than they are, but they're not. <laughs> I 
Well, thank you very much. That is, uh, look forward to getting the full report once you can do it. Are, are, is this going to be pre presented at AFS at all? Or are, yeah. it seems like that kind of study that ought to be presented at AFS, so. Skylar will be presenting at AFS. I'm still, um, I'm still trying to see if I can make it to AFS this year because we have a Yuba work week right after that week. And you know, the mom thing that happens in life, it's kind of hard to break away for two weeks in a row. But Skylar will be presenting um, the bioenergetics project at AFS. And there's other times too. I mean, if there's other formats that we can present at, we'll gladly do it. We have plenty of PowerPoints ready now, but uh, it's a lot of information. It's awesome information. So if you guys hear of some other platform, present it at and let people know, we'd, we'd, we'd be glad to do it. All right, thank you very much. Uh, like I said that is a lot of work. Thank you. I, I, like I've said before, I'm always amazed by the dedication that our biologists, all of you, have for the people that fish here in the state of Utah. I don't think the average fisherman has any idea of the dedication that I, I just amazes me. So thank you. Um, Randy, it does look like we have just a bit of time here. I think we'll break for lunch at noon, but I would, uh, I, if you have a little bit of update on the drought condition, and then maybe we could have the, a little bit on the Pineview uh, discussion right now, whatever you, I, I'll let you take this for a minute here. Yeah, no, that sounds good. Maybe what I'll do is I'll, I'll give a real quick update on drought, and then I've got a very short presentation I can run through real fast that goes over next month's meeting since it's a little bit different meeting and provide some details on that so everyone's ready to go. And then if we've got any time, maybe we could uncap the Pine View discussion, but there might not be that much time to dig deep into it, but maybe we could give people some kind of food for thought for a later discussion in the meeting. Um, the drought end of things, you know, right now we're kind of at a point where we're just monitoring conditions. You know, our snowpack started this winter pretty well, but we haven't received much snow since. So things are starting to decline a little bit. And I, I don't know if anyone's really waving red flags yet, but I, I think, you know, we're starting to get a little nervous that we may be setting up for something similar to last year. Um, in terms of our responses upcoming year, we've been trying to be a little more proactive in terms of how we respond. So we've been working on a drought response plan. There's really kind of two parts of the plan. The first part is an emergency kind of action part, which would be very similar to what we did last year. So it would involve uh, fishing regulation changes and also stocking changes to adapt to low water conditions. The one thing we're probably gonna do a little bit differently is you'll see some of those changes happen earlier this year than previous years. So I think what you'll see is I'm asking the regions to provide me a list of waters where they'd like an emergency regulation change by March 31st of this year. So I expect that, you know, if we're anticipating issues, you may see something about emergency regulations come out maybe the first part of April. What we're gonna do this year is we're gonna allow those regulation changes to roll through. I don't have the exact date in front of me, but it seems like July 7th, six of my header, it's, it's very close to that. And that July 7th timeframe will decide whether we wanna continue those regulations uh, into the fall, or if there's additional waters that we wanna add emergency regulation changes for. So it's a little different than last year, but you might see a very similar response to us. But again, you know, I don't know where we stand right now you know we still have uh, you know another six weeks of you know potential snowy weather so we could build on our snowpack so i don't think we're ready to pull the strings on anything but we are you know starting to think about it a little bit the long-term response for this is something we're still flushing out but you know the one thing we want to do is be as proactive as possible and get the things you know whether we could address water issues through water rights for example to help maybe address waters or perpetual low water conditions or maybe change how we stock some waters if we see again perpetual issues in the water or there's even some talk of maybe looking at some regulation changes that are very adapted to climate change throughout that kind of thing that aren't um, emergency actions. So it might be something like every year beginning in August, we liberalize the regulations on a particular water because it gets low water conditions. So rather than making an emergency, it's just a standard regulation that, you know, between, you know, such a date and another date that there's a, a maybe a liberalized harvest limit. So those are things we're talking about. That's that that response plan is going to take us a little longer to put together. So we're not going to have anything this year per se on it. You know, I think it'll be several 
several more months of work and discussions before we have a plan. But we are looking at that, you know, what we can do to not treat drought conditions as emergency, or at least treat it as an emergency as little as possible, and um, try to incorporate our management some changes that help make us a little bit more robust to drought conditions. If there's any questions on that? Okay. I think not hearing any, I'm going to roll into a just short presentation that I've got that provides a little bit of an overview of next month's meeting. I think we all know that next month's meeting is the joint meeting that we have with Habitat Council. We do this every year in that March timeframe. And um, anyway, what I want to do is just make sure everyone's set up for that meeting, particularly since we have some new members who haven't been through this meeting before, just kind of set people up so they know what to expect for this meeting. So next month's meeting is going to be held on March 23rd. So that, that bucks our traditional trend of the third Thursday of the month because March 23rd is actually a Wednesday. I think it might be the fourth Wednesday or something like that. So it would be a little bit later in the month compared to when we normally hold meetings. The meeting will start at 9 a.m. instead of our usual 10 a.m. And what we're looking at right now is probably an in-person meeting at the Eccles Wildlife Education Center in Farmington. That's where we had our November meeting where we had the seminar for ice fishing. And then before that, we had the meeting. I think there is going to be a virtual element to that meeting. So it might be really a hybrid meeting. I'm still checking on that. We're still working out some logistics on this. So there might be a way to get into the meeting uh, virtually if you want to, so you don't have to travel. But I, I can't promise that, but that's my hunch this is the direction we're going to go. The plan is we will spend the morning, so basically 9 a.m. through lunch break, reviewing projects that are looking for funding from both Blue Ribbon and the Habitat Council. And then we'll break from lunch. I think Habitat Council is going to buy us all lunch, so we don't need to worry about bringing a lunch or anything like that. It'll be taken care of for us. And then in the afternoon, we'll spend a little bit of time talking about projects that are only looking for funding from Blue Ribbon. Uh, usually we don't have too many projects that fit in that boat, so that afternoon session can go by kind of quickly, so we may not stay as long as we sometimes stay. <laughs> Just a couple notes on the meeting. This meeting is going to be led by Eric Edgley. Um, I think we all met Eric when he talked about uh, the water response plan back in, when was it? I think maybe October for our meeting. But Eric's going to lead the meeting instead of me or Rex or somebody else, so you'll see a different face up there. Also, when it comes to project scoring, Habitat Council uses a different scoring process than we use in Blue Ribbon. So they may uh, talk about things a little bit differently than we do, and they oftentimes vote on projects right after a project's presented. So you may see that voting process. That's not something that we do. I'm just kind of letting you know that Habitat Council will be there. They'll be doing their own kind of process in conjunction with our meeting. So anyway, I just kind of want to run over the process for all this. What I'm going to do is probably the first week of March, I will send out a list of projects that are requesting blue ribbon money. That what I'm asking everyone to do, this is maybe a little bit of a change up from previous years, but I'm asking you to go to the Utah Water Shed, uh, sorry, Watershed Restoration Initiative webpage, which is wri.utah.gov, and review each project before the meeting. What I'll do is I'll send out the information on how to get into this WR webpage along with that project list and also make the, the, the project list interactive in such a way that there'll be links there and all the information you need to make it really easy to find the projects. I'm just going to kill this real fast. I'm just going to show you what this watershed restoration initiative webpage kind of looks like. I've just brought up one project that you'll see this year. This is Fish Lake Angling Pier. Um, when you click on the links and use the information, you're going to get to a web page that looks like this, and there's going to be a different page for each project. Um, I'm just going to kind of run you through this so you know what you're looking at. But you see this this title page, which is the first page that comes up. You'll see the title of the project, a very short description of the project. So this one's looking at a, a fishing pier at Fish Lake and expanding the parking lot, installing a fit toilet. A quick summary of the location who's managing the project, and then just some other information just off here, kind of on the bottom page, part of this page. If you go over here to this black box that's on the right-hand side of the screen, that's kind of your menu to go through other portions of this. So if I click Project Details, what you get is a page with a bunch of other boxes of information, and you could scroll through these and it provide a, a longer description of what's going on with the project. The next one is finance. The finance part is broken into two portions. So the upper portion is the budget for the process project. So it kind of tells you what they're going to be spending money on and how much money that they're looking for. 
And then the bottom part's the funding. So these are the places they're looking for money from to complete the project. So in the case of this project, they're getting some money from the Utah Office Outdoor Recreation, some from the Forest Service, and they're requesting some from Blue Ribbon and the Habitat Council. And they have some private donations as well. But you'll get to see that on this web page is that finance portion. Um, you won't see this on this project, but some of these you'll see some information about the species that are going to be affected by the project, the habitats that are affected. You'll see this one for seed. You're not going to see anything filled out, but this this same web page is used for terrestrial projects and aquatic projects, and some of the terrestrial projects are looking for seed. So that's what that's for. You'll see over here comments. There's nothing on this project, but you may see some comments and some questions pop up in here where you might want to just review those and see what people are talking about. And then you see uh, this last one, some images and documents related to the project. So you could see in this case, for instance, a picture that's been uploaded probably of where they're going to put the pier. But anyway, I just want to show you that as kind of just a quick primer of what this web page looks like. So when you get into it, you kind of know what you're getting yourself into here. So anyway, I'll send out that list of projects. I encourage everyone before the meeting to go to that web page and click through every project and just kind of get the gist of what that project is doing. Uh, the one change up I'm asking for this year is I'm asking everyone ahead of the meeting to review the projects and then provide preliminary scores for each project. And I'm going to provide more details on scoring on the next slide. And then my thought is, is once you have those preliminary scores, they aren't going to count for anything, but I just want your thoughts on what those scores would be. And then when we listen to the project presentations that are biologists are going to make on March 23rd, you use those, uh, those presentations as your opportunity to maybe refine your scores a little bit and adjust them with final scores being due April 11th. And I guess my thought here is I think traditionally, you know, these presentations are very short. It seems like they're four or five minutes long. When we ask people to score them, you're really maybe thinking more about the scores than the projects themselves, uh, just because you're, you're really thinking about scoring during that short time window. So I'm hoping that by reviewing them ahead of time and maybe kind of getting your, your, your scores, at least on in pencil on a piece of paper, uh, it maybe takes care of some of that and allows you to maybe listen a little bit more to the projects and what they're proposing. And then my plan is, is we'll spend some time during the April meeting going really project by project and providing feedback back to the division staff about the projects they propose. And I, I'm hoping to use this as an opportunity from, uh, you know, Blue Ribbon, which you guys are all a group of anglers to provide your feedback on how anglers would perceive that project and the recommendations that you have, that kind of thing on the project. So we'll spend some time April kind of reviewing these. So just to kind of go into the scoring process of things, and again, I'll, I'll spell this out all in email, but there's four or sorry, five scoring criteria that each Blue Ribbon member needs to consider for each project. The first one is to what degree does this project enhance fish populations? And you're going to score that on a scale of zero to 10 points, where basically zero means that that project is going to have absolutely no benefit for fish populations, so it's not going to enhance them. And a 10 is that that project is going to provide the most benefit to fish populations that you could possibly conceive. And then you can put any score in between zero and 10. Um, the next one is to what degree does this project enhance fish habitat? It's the exact same, zero to 10 point scale. The third one is to what degree does this project enhance angler access? That's also on the same zero to 10 point scale. Then you have to what degree does this project help provide the staffing needs of the Division of Wildlife Resources requires to successfully accomplish our aquatic section goals? That's also on the zero to 10 point scale. And then the question that kind of bucks the trend is this, this fifth question. It's, do you feel this project has a high likelihood of successfully accomplishing its intended goals? That one, you're going to score either zero points or five points. So nothing in the middle. And you give it zero points if your answer is no to that question and five points if the answer is yes. I can just tell you from past history, if you look at the questions one through four, what you often see is those questions hit on various elements that you might see in a project. So sometimes we see very habitat driven projects or, you know, you might see a very angler access driven project. So what you'll often see is the project score very well in one of those uh, questions in that first four. So one through four and then maybe not so well in the others. And that, that's pretty standard. I just wanted to give you a heads up on that. But anyway, you're scoring them. Those are the, the five elements that you're going to score, the five questions that you're going to consider. So what I'm going to do is I'll send, and I've done this traditionally ahead of the, each meeting, a spreadsheet that helps you organize your scores. That's wh where you would enter your scores. I prefer that you put them in the spreadsheet because it makes things really easy to tabulate the scores. And it's also easier for you to send them out because the spreadsheet will automatically get your scores. You don't have to send them back to me or anything like that when you enter them. But I know some people prefer to do it using a paper uh, scoring sheet. So I will provide a paper sheet that you print off and fill out 
the point is I set a, a August, sorry, April 11th due date for all this. I will accept scores up till April 11th and I'll take them any way you get them to me. So whether it's on that spreadsheet or if you want to scan a paper sheet, send to me by email, send me a text max or message picture of your scores or send me your scoring sheet by mail. I don't really care. I just took them to receive them by April 11th. And then the last thing, and this is just for full disclosure in the background, I, I do do some scoring myself on these projects. We've done this for the last handful of years. And the reason that we do this is it takes away uh, maybe some of the elements that you have to consider for the projects and the things that I score are completely objective things, yes, no kind of things. And we had some inconsistency on these things in projects. So by me scoring them, what it does is it provides a little bit more consistency to the responses. And then also I'll put my scores up so everyone can review them if I miss something. But the four things I look at, and they're just yes, no questions where I give zero for a no and five points for a yes. The first one is, is this project on a blue ribbon focal water. So I score those yes, no. The next one is in the presentation, do they discuss the fiscal pre details of the project? If they discuss them, I give them five points. If they don't discuss them, I give them a zero. The next one is, are there any partners providing funding for the project? So if blue ribbon's the only funding source, I provide a zero. And if there's another partner on there or more than one partner on there, I provide five points. And then if there's any mention of monitoring and reporting or findings, I, I give it five points. Okay, that's all I have. I know somebody raised their hand. Yeah, TJ, I see your hands up. I've just got a couple of questions. Um, about three slides back, you had the date deadline of March 23, and the meeting is March 29 with Habitat Council. So is that a, a deadline for us or what? No, so let me just double check here to make sure I have my Unless dates. My right. eyes are bad. Okay, so. The meeting with Habitat Council itself is March 23rd. 23rd, because this is, this uh, uh, agenda we got has it at March 29, so it's the 23rd? It's the 23rd, yes. Okay. And then on criteria number four, the one that talks about staffing, how do we really rate that? Yeah, that, that's one we've run into a challenge for. I mean, honestly, I would say if it's a staffing project, probably provided a 10 because we're requesting it, unless you think it's totally unnecessary. The reason we added that one is we've had some issues in the past when we look at the scoring of projects, particularly projects where they're looking for staffing. They don't enhance fish populations directly. They don't enhance habitat directly, et cetera. And what was happening is they get almost zero points. So they never scored very well. So we added a way to add some points here for kind of staffing related projects to help them rank out a little bit better. But yeah, that's something that's come up before. And, you know, again, my advice is, yeah, that is kind of an internal question, but probably make it a 10 if, if, you, if you think it is. And probably it's not going to pick up any other points for the other stuff. So it still may end up with a low score, but at least it helps us score some. Yeah, Rex. Uh, TJ, uh, the reason that the 29th was on there is when I made up this agenda, we weren't sure exactly when it was going to be, and that was the tentative date was the 29th. So that's where that came in from. It was uh, just trying to make sure that, uh, that that we had a date and they could adjust to it. So it, it's now set on the 23rd at 9 o'clock. Okay, are there any other questions? Yeah, I'll spell all this out in an email. So this this will come out. But... Um... I just wanted to say it verbally, give everyone a chance to ask any questions if you have questions. So we get that. Okay, I guess that's all that I got, Rex. All right, thank you, Randy, appreciate it. Um, I think, I, Clint, I, maybe you can answer this. Did you have somebody coming on that was going to do some more with Pine View or is this something that we could discuss at this point and uh, uh, maybe in the meeting slightly earlier. I just, I, I wanna make sure that whatever you have lined up, we have, we cover it for you. Hey, so I'm just getting ready to leave my house and head to the office. Um, we got something going there for, for lunch today for Cody. So Chris Penny is already in the meeting. I called him a few minutes ago and said, hey, they're gonna bump things up. So Chris is gonna be able to discuss Pineview and access and start answering your questions. Um, and I'm just gonna have you on my phone as we as I travel to the office and just listen. So 
Um, but Chris is is already on the meeting, so he's ready to go. We can we can see him, Clinton. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for your input, uh, Chris. Uh, it, we had a, a question. I, you've been in on some of the emails, so I'm not surprising you with anything. I just thought that this was something where it was brought up by you know former Blue Ribbon that maybe we ought to at least be aware of what's happening here, so we could you know if there's anything that Blue Ribbon can do to enhance the situation for the fishermen, those that fish that we can do it. So if you don't mind taking a few minutes, Chris, we'd sure appreciate your input. Yeah, sure thing, Rex. And uh, th thanks for giving this a little bit of time and, and thanks for the committee okay. taking part in it. Um, do you want me to just kind of start from the beginning on where we're, where we're at with Pineview? Yes, please. Okay, so Pineview has been a blue ribbon fishery for a number of years and, and some of that has to do with the tiger muskie, but other aspects of it also are the panfish community, which is yellow perch and black crappie. And a lot of the fishing for those takes place, particularly in the wintertime, ice fishing. So we've done creel surveys, and about 50% of the pressure that Pineview receives is during the winter months during the ice fishing season. That's when it really opens up to people. And it is a very high traffic recreational water, especially for recreational boating. And so I think while anglers would like to use it a little bit more during the summertime, a lot of them really limit their trips to early morning and late evening hours just so they don't have to compete with some of the big wake boats. Etc. cetera. Um, so as, as Ray pointed out, uh, over the short term, it does seem like access has been getting more and more limited for anglers at Pineview. Um, we're now in the second year of Cemetery Point, which is one of the main accesses for ice fishing, um, being limited to just a few spots instead of a whole parking lot, which it used to have. Uh, some of this is because of uh, liability policies between the Forest Service and the concessionaire, where I believe the concessionaire is liable for damages even when they're not there. Um, that one seems like a little bit of a bureaucratic thing, but uh, what we have been seeing at Pineview is just the Forest Service has really been getting hammered with vandalism over the years, particularly during the winter months or shoulder seasons when nobody is there to watch. And so um, the head ranger there, what his plan is to do is he would like to leave all these areas open year round. However, he can't do that until he fortifies these areas, um, at least in his mind, because the vandalism has really gotten out of control. He's usually suffering anywhere between fifteen to thirty thousand dollars at least over the winter time from damages. People with the proximity of the reservoir to the town of Ogden, we don't think these are necessarily ice anglers. People are just coming up, hooking on the door. Sorry, Chris, we're not hearing you now. Okay. Now, there we go. Our uh, our Northern Region office doesn't always have the best internet. So I'll tell you what, I'm going to turn off my camera in order to just kind of maximize what I'm putting out. And then uh, if you guys lose me again, let me know. All right. Uh, I'm not sure quite where I was lost, but, but basically vandalism has just kind of peaked to the point where the Forest Service really just can't afford to address this every year in their existing budget. And so what the head ranger feels has to be done is to fortify the place before he can open places back up. And so he's gonna try and armor it um, by getting a few new things. Like for instance, there was a gate that was put in at the port ramp area to close it off during certain times of year and just basically keep people from being destructive in there. Um, in other cases, what he ultimately wants to do, and this is gonna take several years, um, but it is part of the Great American Outdoors Act funding um, that they're receiving is they're going to basically open up each area um, that includes three main areas, the port ramp area, the cemetery area, and the Anderson Cove area. They're going to open each of those up with a concessionaire all winter long that's there. And the thought with that is that there will be more eyes there to keep an eye on things um, during those times of year. The, the rough part is that this is going to take some time and some of the best areas to fish are not going to be the ones that open first. So, for example, Anderson, uh, the Anderson Cove area is probably going to be the first to open back up to the public fully during the winter time. And traditionally, that's not been uh, one of the best fishing areas for people. And so it, it's going to take some time. Um, do we have any questions before I kind of move forward? Okay, Rex. Chris, I would. I, I just was wondering, uh, is there some way that maybe we could provide funding that would, uh, you know, you report somebody vandalizing that 
you know, make it uh, 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 so that uh, folks are more on the on the outlook. I, I doesn't make sense to me that ice those that ice fish would all of a sudden in the last few years just decide that they were going to vandalize the properties up there uh, when they haven't been doing it for years and years. So, right. Um, I that that I just wondered if there was maybe something that might allow us to get access maybe on a little less than years program. Right. I, I agree, Mickey. And I, I think that's something to discuss and in, in kind of where the uh the committee can help. Um because yeah, it, it doesn't seem to make a ton of sense to close the place down because of the actions of a few bad apples. Um however I do understand that you know the damages that they're incurring just can't can't continue. So uh, what I will say is they have funded, I believe, two police officers that they've shared with the town of Huntsville. That hasn't made a dent since the police officers haven't been able to be around all the time. I think, though, where Blue Ribbon can maybe extend a hand is to ask if perhaps, I don't know, can funding be put in for cameras, you know, in certain areas? I'm not sure what federal restrictions are there, though there, there could already be a restriction in place that doesn't allow that. Perhaps that's something that's already been thought of. Um, or yeah, any sort of signage assisting with, with reporting these types of things. But uh, that that is kind of the pinch that they're in. Yes, Larry? Just out of curiosity, if they're gonna bid out concessionaires, is the cameras perhaps a component, uh, a component of the RFP that could be put out for concessionaires is, is a requirement? I'm, I'm sure it could. I mean, I'm not sure how the Forest Service works. Um, I think what it would come down to on that, Larry, is who's written as liable as well, you know, when these damages occur, if it's up to the concessionaire, if it's under their watch, or if it still falls to the Forest Service. So I think that may determine who, who would want to take on that responsibility. That doesn't seem fair to put it on the concessionaire. I mean, they're, they're just trying to sell sandwiches and such, but anyways. Right, right. So some of these questions we're kind of getting at, like where where the committee I think could be of help is definitely advocacy here. Um, I, I don't necessarily agree with everything that the Forest Service is doing. I understand why they're doing it. Um, and I, I might even do the same thing if I were in their position. However, just kind of noting from another prominent angling group, in fact, one of the most prominent angling groups, uh, your concern about the loss of access here, I think goes a long way. and. You know, one one area that I think particularly could be of help that's low hanging fruit, you know, in the coming months is the gate that has been installed at Port Ramp. A lot of the rationale for that is to make sure that they're closing the place off at night so that nobody can get in that's come from Powell or other AIS infested waters when there's not somebody there and watching. Um, and, and that does make sense. However, right now they have it set so that during summer, the gate will open at 6 a.m. And I am aware just from personal observations, there's a lot of anglers that would like to be out on the water earlier than that. And so even just opening that up by an hour would be some low hanging fruit. But I, I think just making the Forest Service aware of, of the difficulty that this is causing anglers, I think goes a long way. And at least my opinion as a fisheries manager, I mean, if access is one of the criteria for being a blue ribbon fishery, I mean, considering taking that blue ribbon status away or at least discussing that um, is worthwhile. A few other things that I'll throw out there though, if this transitions to happen, and, and I think it's probably a, a good thing that uh, we're gonna have more access year round and more eyes on the place. One of the things that could also be done is perhaps helping fund more fish habitat because uh, as an example, that Anderson Cove area that's the South Arm is not prominently one of the best areas to fish. However, some of the underwater habitat that we've put in over previous years has shown to really attract fish. And so perhaps we can turn some of those areas into better areas to fish in the short term and kind of help, help relieve some of that pain. Chris, could we, uh, would it be beneficial at some point if you think it is, I, would you like something, maybe a letter worded from Blue Ribbon Fisheries? That, I mean, to the Forest Service, I just, as a possibility, uh, I just thought I would at least mention that. Absolutely. I mean, I, I think that'd be a great start, Rex. And uh, probably discussion with, with Sean Harwood, the head ranger there would be good. Um, 
I've talked with him now several times as I've expressed these concerns. And he, he is pretty good at communicating, um, and, and he'll tell you about the long-term plan that he has, and he is open to discussion with about anyone, because I, I know he does feel like he's truly doing what's right here, even, even if it does rub a few people the wrong way. But uh, just, I think, engaging in a discussion and, and letting him understand where you guys are coming from, guys and gals, would be a great thing. Thanks, uh, Chris. I'll, I'll, I've got a note here to put that on the agenda and then a personal note to give him a call. Okay. Are there any other questions regarding, I guess, Pineview and, and, and the way things have gone or how they got to be where they are now? <clears throat> okay. If nobody else has anything, well, thanks for letting me speak about this for a few minutes. Oh, we appreciate you coming on, Chris, and taking some of your time to do that. It's very gracious of you, so thank you very much. And I knew you were aware of the problem, so I, I'm glad that uh, we could reach out to you and, and that you'd be willing. So thank you very much. And I, I'll put this on the agenda for April. Obviously, March doesn't exist for any of us, so... We might as well put it on the April agenda and see what we can do to help move forward. But if you think that might be something, we we have some really good wordsmiths that are part of this Blue Ribbon Council that uh, maybe we can work out something there. So thank you. Fantastic. Yes, thank you. And if you need any statistics too, uh, feel free to come my way. We've got some data on, on at least how the fisheries performed over the years in angler use. Okay. I making a note of that real quick, Chris. So statistics. All right, thank you. Okay, much appreciated. Thank you, Chris. Randy, I I think we're coming up on our break for lunch. Should we just come back at one o'clock if that's all right with you? Yeah, I'm totally good with that. So we'll come back at one o'clock and continue that discussion we had from last meeting about uh kind of our future direction here at Blue Ribbon. Uh, I'll start off by providing just a kind of quick summary of the last meeting, and then I've invited a couple of representatives from the Attorney General office to come in and talk about the executive order for Blue Ribbon and give you a chance to you know, ask any questions about that. And then we're gonna do kind of a breakout session sort of thing. Well, I'm gonna break everyone up into groups of probably four or five people, and we'll uh, dive into maybe some strategies that we can employ to maybe kind of address some of the things that came up to the Blue Ribbon Survey. So that's kind of the game plan for the afternoon. All right, thank you very much. I guess we will see you all back here at uh, one o'clock mountain time.
Welcome to the afternoon session of the February 17th, 2022 Blue Ribbon Fisheries Advisory Council. I'm Rex Sinfair, I'm the chair this year and leading this afternoon's discussion will be Randy Opplinger, our director from the Division of Wildlife Resources. Randy, I didn't have anything else. So if you're at the point that you'd like to take it, uh, uh, I did notice that Cal Black joined us and uh, uh, Carrie Ellsworth, I did mention earlier. So I welcome both Cal and Carrie. Okay, well, thank you, Rex. Um, thank you for everyone getting back on this afternoon. We had a pretty good discussion after last month's meeting about kind of the future direction of Blue Ribbon. And our intention is to continue that discussion here this afternoon. And um, I'm sure we won't complete it today, but I think hopefully the discussions today leave us some good pieces that help us to maybe kind of formulate a final plan at our next meeting. So maybe one more meeting, maybe, maybe a meeting after that. We'll just see what it takes, but one or two more meetings and we'll be done with this effort. I did see just just a kind of an FYI that Kyle Maynard, who's our representative for the Division of Wildlife Resources for uh, the Attorney General Office, he logged in. I'm going to have him do a little presentation here in a minute, but before we get to that, what I wanted to do is provide just some quick, I, I think, kind of a refresher of what we talked about the last meeting, just to kind of remind everyone and maybe set the stage for some of the discussions today. So what I'm going to do is share my screen, and I'm going to repeat some of the slides that we saw last time. I'm giving a far more condensed version of the presentation I gave last time, but I'm just doing that again as just kind of a refresher as we kind of go forward here. Can everyone see my screen? Does that come up like a presentation? Yes, hey. we can okay, see. Awesome. It. Yeah, thank you for letting me know. Okay, so again, we're kind of continuing this discussion about the future direction of the Blue Ribbon Fisheries Advisory Council. Um, really what this is about is just providing continued relevance to the Blue Ribbon Program if we look into the future. If you look at the original intent behind the development of Blue Ribbon, it was largely focused on rural economic development. Our thoughts at the time were that there was a lot of fisheries in the state that are very high quality fisheries that are rural parts of the state, and there were some opportunities there to maybe uh, um, do some improvements to those fisheries, make them just better better fisheries, better angler access, better fishing quality, et cetera, to help draw people into those fisheries and help uh, the economies in those, low, those rural areas. Uh, we think for the large part that we've done what we can in that arena, and we think maybe it's time for Blue Ribbon to maybe consider where we want to go in the future. So a lot of what we're talking about is kind of what emerging topics can Blue Ribbon focus on in the future that'll help benefit anglers, not just now, but looking down the road. Uh, one thing, and we'll kind of get into this when Kyle presents, but we're not looking at rewriting the executive order for Blue Ribbon, but we're looking at how we kind of do business on a day-to-day -day basis. It's going to make Blue Ribbon better. I think there's a good chance that we're going to have to revise the handbook after we're done with this quote unquote plan that we're working on right now, but we'll see how things kind of line up after we're done with that. And we can discuss that here at a future meeting. But really in the end of the day, what this is all about is that each of you on Blue Ribbon represent anglers in the state and the division is relying on you to provide advice to us on how we manage our fisheries in a manner that are going to help um, I guess provide the maximum benefit for anglers so we're looking for finding ways that we can maximize the impact that each blue ribbon member has on fishing in the state so we're looking to use your voice to help us do some good on the ground that help our anglers so that's kind of what this is all about I quickly just want to provide just a refresher from the last meeting, and I, I think this slide sums up well, but this is a very complicated slide. I'll walk you through this very slowly, but I think as all of you know that we sent out some surveys ahead of the last meeting, and we use those surveys to uh, get some perceptions of how people think Blue Ribbon is doing. Uh, more or less, if you look at the current Blue Ribbon Handbook, there's six objectives laid out in that handbook. And when we ask people, so we ask past Blue Ribbon members, current Blue Ribbon members, and uh, division staff members, kind of their perceptions on how Blue Ribbon is performing in the arenas of those six objectives and how important those six objectives are. And what happens is, and I'm showing this on the left slide, which is kind of a, um, a, a hypothetical figure here. If you plot the performance scores 
on the vertical axis, and then the important scores on the horizontal axis, what quadrant those points lie in tells you a lot about how we're doing as a Blue Ribbon program. So the idea here is if something lies up in the upper left-hand corner when you plot the performance score against the important score, what it means is it's possible overkill. So in other words, it's something that we're performing very well at, but it's not very important. So we're probably spending too much time in that because it's not a very important topic. If it's in the upper right quarter, quadrant, um, what that means is it's both very important and we're performing very well at that task. So that's something that we want to keep up the good work at. If it's in the bottom left corner, what it means is it's something we're not performing very well at, but it's also not very important. So there's no need for us to really put much effort into improving in a certain area when a certain area is just not very important at the end of the day. And then the final one, the lower right one, um, basically represents situations where the importance is very high, but our current performance is very low. So because it's very important, but we're not doing very well, these are areas that we want to concentrate in because if we concentrate in them and improve our performance, it's going to provide a lot of benefit. So that's kind of an overview of how to interpret these slides, um, these, these graphs, sorry. Um, I'm showing the graphs for the past uh, Blue Ribbon members, the current Blue Ribbon members, and the staff members on the right side of the screen. The different colored dots represent the six different objectives that I talked about that are in the handbook. If we look at the top figures, these are the past members, what we find is that for all six objectives, the points are in that upper right quadrant, which means that the perception coming from the past Blue Ribbon members is that we're doing pretty well in those areas and we should keep up the work. If we look at that middle graph, we have our current Blue Ribbon members. What we see here is that three of the points are in that upper right quadrant. We've got two of them that are right on the line that straddles between uh, keep up the good works to the upper right and there's something we want to concentrate on, which is the lower right. And then we've got one point, which is this collaboration. This is collaboration between uh, basically Blue Ribbon and other governmental agencies. We find that falls down in that concentrate here kind of zone. And then if we look at the perceptions of our division staff members, what we find is for the most part, all the points lined up in this concentrate here quadrant. The one exception is provide funding, which staff members definitely indicated through the survey that they wanted to see Blue Ribbon continue to provide funding for their projects through the state. So that's kind of a graphical summary of the results. Uh, the other thing that we did is we asked our staff members to just give um, kind of a, a written description in their own words of what they thought the future vision of Blue Ribbon should be. We got responses from eight staff members. What I did is I went through everyone's responses and I categorized uh, basically the themes that were brought up in their responses. And what I've done is I've shown a summary of this here on this graph or on the left or this table. What I'm showing on the left side is basically the theme that was expressed. And on the right side, I'm showing the number of responses that we received that expressed that particular theme. And again, that's out of eight total responses. And then what I've done is I've ranked these where what was uh, came up the most frequently is at the top, and then it gets progressively less frequent in our staff responses as you move down. Uh, but anyway, the point is, if you look at the top one, provide advice to the Division of Wildlife Resources from the viewpoint of an angler came up in six of the eight responses that we received from our staff members. So I think a very strong underlying theme we got from the staff members is um, among staff, you know, we're, we're biologists, we're maybe a little too much into our work in terms of how we see things, maybe a bias is a little bit. And I think they saw a lot of value in having anglers. So a group of people like Blue Ribbon, giving us some feedback on how we're doing in terms of maybe angler access or how waters fishing and i think they were looking uh, most of these responses to get more of that kind of feedback going on so they have a better understanding of how their work is performing from that viewpoint of the anglers uh, the next kind of most common response we got was uh, some reflection of a lack of diversity among Blue Ribbon members. And when they were talking about diversity, they were talking mainly about fishing interest diversity. Um, there are a lot of Blue Ribbon members right now who are interested in fishing for trout, and they felt that maybe we needed a little more diversity in uh, anglers who uh, maybe fish for other kinds of fish, particularly warm water species. So that was expressed in four of the eight responses. Four of the eight responses uh, specifically uh, expressed interest in having Blue Ribbon continue to fund projects like we've done historically. We have three uh, staff members who wanted to see Blue Ribbon to do more to both enhance and protect current Blue Ribbon waters. So the thought beyond among these staff members was oftentimes we nominate a water as a Blue Ribbon fishery. And then off the back of that, 
excuse me, we don't do too much to maybe maintain the blue ribbon status on those waters, and they wanted to see us do more in that realm. Two of the eight staff members wanted us to do more to help identify new blue ribbon fisheries. I think the thought here is traditionally we've had uh, division staff members identify potential blue ribbon waters, and I think they wanted maybe a little bit more feedback from blue ribbon members themselves on what waters maybe warrant blue ribbon status and help maybe identify some of those waters that get evaluated by the council. Two of the eight staff members wanted us to maybe do a little bit more to improve our member recruitment efforts. Uh, those staff members, I think, primarily are in kind of rural parts of the state where we've maybe struggled at recruiting new Blue Ribbon members when old regional members have maybe left the council. So I think they wanted to see us maybe do a little bit more to assist them in that realm and recruit new members to the council. Two people thought that we spent too much time uh, identifying new Blue Ribbon fisheries. And then the last about four or five things on there were only expressed by one of the eight people. But one was that we have too many Blue Ribbon waters in the state. Another one thought that we need to do a little bit more to train Blue Ribbon members about how we function as a council. One person thought that the regions should be the ones who determine what waters are Blue Ribbon, and that's not something that's done by a council like Blue Ribbon. And instead, Blue Ribbon is really just a, a moniker or an outreach designation that helps identify the best fisheries in the state. Now, I just will kind of point out that the person who said this also expressed interest in having an advisory council that provides um, kind of angler feedback on how the division manages fisheries. And they also felt that there was a need to uh, have some kind of council that helps provide funding for projects. So in a lot of ways, I think they, they, they liked the approach that we currently have for Blue Ribbon, but they wanted to see the division maybe carry more of a role in determining what waters are Blue Ribbon. We had one person who thought that Blue Ribbon could do more to publicly advocate what fisheries need to survive and thrive. I think this was really motivated by a lot of recent issues, particularly with drought. And then we also had somebody thought the Blue Ribbon should do more educational seminars to maybe inform the public about fisheries issues. So I think their interest here was maybe less into seminars that tell people about um, how to catch a kokanee salmon, for example, and more kind of bringing the public up to speed about various issues affecting fisheries and how the division is addressing those. So that's kind of just a quick and dirty summary of the results from that survey. Again, I spent more time last meeting going into those results, but I really wanted that to kind of set the stage for today's conversation because I think we want to have some of those results in our mind as we have some of our discussions today. So anyway, for today's meeting, um, I'm about to turn the reins over to Kyle from our Attorney General's office. So I'm going to let him provide just a broad overview of the Blue Ribbon Executive Order. And then after that, I would like us to continue some of the discussions that we were having from the last meeting. What we're going to do is break out some breakout sessions within the Google Meets app that we're using right now. And in small groups will discuss things and consolidate maybe people's thoughts and what we can do. And we'll have some future discussions about that. And I think probably those that discussion is going to take up a, a large chunk of time here today. So I think probably we'll kind of take what comes from this discussion and that'll be the material that starts off the next meeting. And we'll work on kind of refining that a little bit after that. What I am going to ask as we kind of move into some of the discussions today after Kyle presents is consider what Kyle talks about and some of the sideboards that we have within the Blue Ribbon Executive Order in terms of how we can operate. And then also I'd like us to maybe consider how Blue Ribbon can expand the scope of our program to be more inclusive of the full breadth of what we do within the Division of Wildlife Resources Aquatic Section. So this Blue Ribbon funding that we have um, is kind of unique here within the division. We don't have a similar funding source for waters that are not Blue Ribbon in the state or for our native fishes in the state. Also, we've got efforts like the Wildlife Migration Initiative, some water prioritization efforts within kind of our drought response plan or a division water plan we've got going on, and the Division of Wildlife Resources Strategic Plan that are all um, important plans that guide how we operate within the aquatic section, but these plans are very diverse. They've, they include sport fish and native fish elements and blue ribbon waters, not blue ribbon waters. They really affect all fisheries throughout the state. So I, I'm just kind of bringing those up as examples of this full breadth of kind of what we do within the aquatic section. And I think we would like to maybe have some discussions and considerations of how we can incorporate that in what we do. So are there any questions before we move on here? Okay. Well, with that, what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn the reins over to Kyle Maynard, and I don't know if Marty's there or not, but Kyle is with our Attorney General's office. He's our Attorney General representative for the Division of Wildlife Resources. 
And what I did is I asked him to come in and talk a little bit about the Blue Ribbon Executive Order, what goes into that executive order, and kind of what the sideboards are for that executive order. So how much leeway we have to maybe change some of what the council um, does without kind of breaking what's in that executive order. I just see Drew just commented that Marty's also on, so we've got both of those representatives. So what I'll do is I'll just turn it over to Kyle and Marty here and let you guys kind of go into some of that, if you don't mind. Afternoon. Thank, uh, thank you, Randy. And uh, like Randy said, I'm, I'm Kyle Maynard. Um, Marty, who just turned his camera on, is uh, you all probably know as well. Um, he still works in the AG's office um, and has been helping me out with wildlife. Um, so I don't have I don't have a, a slide presentation or anything. I just thought I would log on and, and talk to you all for a little bit. Uh, I appreciate you giving me the time. Um, so looking into kind of this idea of expanding or, or changing how the Blue Ribbon Fishery Advisory Council wants to address subjects, you know, Randy asked me to look at the executive order and talk about these, the origin of this council and, and what the sideboards or the, the boundaries of what this authority is. Um, so in 2005, I'm sure all of you have seen it it's in, in your handbook, uh, Governor Huntsman created the Blue Ribbon Fisheries Advisory Council. Um, there's you know about seven bullet points um, that outline the different tasks outlined for the Blue Ribbon, Blue Ribbon Fisheries Advisory Council to tackle um, you know, those um, subjects are, you know, identifying new fisheries throughout the state, recommending enhancement for those ecosystems uh, and the aesthetic values, the protection of the Blue Ribbon fisheries through collaboration with government agencies and private groups, uh, recommendations to promote Blue Ribbon fisheries to attract tourism, um, and it then starts going to meeting as necessary as possible, um, outlining how the council functions. So when looking at, you know, the horizon and, and what the advisory council can, can do and what the authority is derived from, you're pretty caged in by it, how everything relates back to uh, Blue Ribbon Fisheries. Uh, so one example I was trying to think of uh, and then actually Randy used this example in his email to me, but uh, talking about how anglers are, are impacted by, by climate change and, and could the um, advisory council make a recommendation on how the state should handle um, those impacts to anglers more broadly, or is this, how does that work? Um, you know, that's a, an example where the advisory council can discuss those topics as broadly as it likes, but when it comes to the recommendations, it's always good to relate it back to uh, the, the Blue Ribbon Fisheries. So, you know, if, you're sub, if your area is of expertise is a specific fishery, uh, there are some impacts that are going to be able to, to apply more broadly. Uh, but as far as the recommendation to the division would go or to the state, you always kind of want to relate it back to that um, subject matter. Um, and, you know, does that make sense? Is, do I have any questions? Or Marty, do you want to fill in? You know, I might just add one thing at this point is every administrative agency in the state, every board, commission, um, council is a creation of either the legislature or the executive branch um, which is creating them under authority granted to it by the legislature of the Constitution. And so whenever these entities are created, um, they are given certain authorities, delegated, you know, to carry out. And generally, you can't go beyond those authorities. That is the scope of what the entity that created you has given you. So, for instance, the Division of Wildlife Resources, our world is confined, you know, to protected wildlife. And there are species that are not considered protected, like coyotes, raccoons, gophers, ground squirrels, jackrabbits. 
and the division has no authority to to regulate or try to control those species. It's outside our jurisdiction to do so. And the same would apply. Um, the wildlife board's not going to get or shouldn't be getting into making recommendations to the Department of Agriculture and Food, for instance, or the division to interact with the Department of Agriculture and Food on matters that don't have some nexus to wildlife or protected wildlife. So it's it's, it's a general premise that you know as you're as a council you created by the governor via his executive order, and that order obligates or, or charges you to carry out a number of things. Every one of those is tied to blue ribbon fisheries. Uh, there's nothing there written so broad as to, to look that you could go beyond blue ribbon fisheries. Um, there are, I mean, climate change, if you wanted to talk about that, and I mean, you could cast it in the context of blue ribbon fisheries and it may be, you know, whatever recommendations are made um, to the extent they're helpful to blue ribbon fisheries, they'd probably be helpful to other fisheries as, all, as well um, that the division could consider. But I think where you guys go, what you look at, if it's gonna be something you're gonna vote on and make a recommendation, it's gonna have to be tied to that, you know, those blue ribbon fisheries. I see Drew's got his hand up. I, I might have missed it, Kyle and Marty. Uh, the, but the governor's order, as as I think you described and I read, uh, talks about the council and its actions, but it doesn't specifically limit the money that's there to be used for some of these other priorities that the council may agree with, and we might as well. Uh, one of them was water purchases or in-stream flow. And I just wanted to ask that question: If there, if the walk of all of the money has to and must be used just specifically for blue ribbon fisheries, or can it? Is there some latitude there? What money are we talking? Are we talking about money that's been appropriated for blue ribbon fisheries by the legislature? Yes, sir. Well. Um, my understanding of that as well is, I mean, if it's been appropriated to a specific purpose, the agency can't use it for an alternate purpose, um, unless we could somehow tie it to Blue Ribbon Fisheries. So I, I don't know what the appropriation language is, but that would be helpful if it was, you know, appropriated to Blue Ribbon Fisheries, or appropriated for the Blue Ribbon Fisheries Council to make recommendations on Blue Ribbon Fisheries. That's where it's going to have to be, but if the appropriation language is a lot broader, is that in it? Is that it's money? It's appropriated to the division, correct? I, I misspoke, Marty. Uh, that money is restricted in DJ that the division set aside uh, for Blue Ribbon, and so it's it's the same as really you know the rest of our DJ and restricted. It's just earmarked. Uh, for those purposes internally. And I'm assuming that was appropriated by the legislature, right? I mean, that amount, it was blessed, if you will. It was a result of a license increase, Marty. Yeah, well, I mean, I know that, I mean, we got those restricted accounts and the DJ, you know, monies, tax monies, but my understanding is we still have to get that appropriated before we can actually use it for a particular purpose, even though it's money that's we've generated, it's not appropriated, it's not allocated to us from tax dollars per se. Um, but even money that an agency generates, it, they've got to still identify what money of that they're going to spend on what projects and then the legislature approves that through an appropriation. Even if it's not in the governor's order? Yes, I mean, I can't see anything in the governor order about money or how to spend money. I mean, it could, if, if it's being spent on blue ribbon fisheries, I think there's a, there's a strong argument to say that the Blue Ribbon Fisheries Council has, you know, could make useful recommendations on that. I guess the question I'm getting now is, is if that money has been appropriated for blue ribbon fisheries, I mean, it's been identified for use in that, can we change it? Um, my understanding is no, unless we're going to 
go back and get the legislature to change that appropriation. But I don't know. I don't know what the language, you know, how it's written or what it was said. So it's, it's kind of hard to, you know, uh, forecast exactly how you might be able to spend it. If it's written broadly, you may have more latitude. If it's, you know, written real narrowly, then less okay. discretion. It sounds like we'll have to look at that a little bit more. I've I've got a kind of money question as well, and that question is: uh, sometimes we have waters that were formerly blue ribbon fisheries, where they maybe lost their blue ribbon status because of an extraneous, mm -hmm. I don't know, circumstance. You know, the the fisheries changed over time. Or conversely, we've got waters that are very nearly blue ribbon waters, but they need maybe a little bit of something to happen. You know, a little angler access project or something to bump them up to blue ribbon status. I guess my point is, is you know, in all these cases, these are waters where uh, probably any money that we spent would result in those waters becoming blue ribbon. Is that appropriate, even if they're not currently blue ribbon waters? But that's the intent is to get them to blue ribbon status when we spend that money. I think so. I mean, that's. Um, I mean, your responsibilities are to designate blue ribbon fisheries, enhance fishing um, ecosystems and aesthetic values of such fisheries make recommendations for the protection and and to promote it. But I mean, when this whole thing started, there were no technical blue ribbon fisheries that you went out, you found some that met the criteria as you established it and others that I think you could work towards getting that. I, I think that's close enough to your authorities is that you're trying to, a water that with a little work, a little money, could become a blue ribbon fishery. I mean, I, th I think that's close enough. I don't know, Kyle, you have a different opinion or? No, I, I have the same opinion. You know, and I think that falls pretty squarely in, in what the executive order outlines as far as identifying what what you want to see as a blue ribbon fishery. So those former fisheries, if, if those are not of concern to have those back as a, as a blue ribbon fishery, then, you know, that's a, a different, you know, conversation to plan out as, as a council. Um, but if you're trying to restore that status and bring in a new status, you know, you have both the identifying those fisheries as well as the enhancement provision. Many times when you've got a, a, a charge to accomplish a certain objective, um, there is consideration of that you can do all things necessary and incidental to in order to accomplish that objective. Um, it's it's assumed they're not explicitly stated, but it's assumed that I mean, if you're out to promote, enhance, designate um, blue ribbon fisheries, you know, inherent would be that with it. I think is to help you know foster and identify, create more blue ribbon fisheries. Um, so. Okay. Awesome. Thank you. Any other questions from anyone? I just to comment, Randy. I, in the handbook, it says or potential blue ribbon waters. So, as long as we're working toward it becoming a blue ribbon water, then that seems to fall into that genre. Is that correct, Marty or Kyle? I'm, where in the handbook are you reading? Are you reading the governor's order or? It's. I think it's on page the second or third page. I. I'm sorry. I'm on vacation out in Hawaii, and I didn't bring my handbook with me for some reason. Yeah, <laughs> his, his, he's talking about the handbook, not the executive. You're, hope, you're hoping for sympathy here. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah no. <laughs> no. I'll be more than happy to just you know raise my computer so y'all can see the view out the lanai down oh. to the ocean. <laughs> That's inhumane. <laughs> No, I, I, in the handbook that we have, it does mention not the executive order, but the 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 handbook itself says potential yeah. blue ribbons, and and that seems to me that what you're talking about from the governor that that's yeah I, I mean, what our what we can do. Yeah, it the executive order doesn't say to um, help create, but it, I think it's it's clearly within the things they did charge you to do. Because I say, when this all started, there were no blue ribbon fisheries. So everything you did was doing one of two things. One is just 
identifying, designating those that were already there, and others are, you know, identifying waters that were close, and maybe through a little bit of work, we could get them there. And I, again, I think, I think you're good in that arena as long as everything's getting tied back to um, a blue ribbon fishery, you know, protecting, promoting, enhancing, designating, and actually, you know, trying to, I guess, create some blue ribbon fisheries through projects. Well, I, I, I think, cause I kind of end uh, as part of the group that been on the council long enough that kind of getting toward the end of identifying all those waters. Now, I think what we're trying to do is how do we move forward with protecting them, promoting them? What can we do with them? Is that, uh, that mm -hmm. at least that's how I see where we need to move now. I, we may find one or two more blue ribbon waters, but what do we do to make the very best out of the ones we've got now is seems to me that we've just got to keep going, especially with the charts that Randy showed. I mean, they're just, it took a long time to say, okay, all of these are the ones that we really think are the blue ribbon. These are special in the state of Utah. Yep. I mean, enhancement, I mean, existing ones, you clearly got authority to try to enhance existing designations. Um, and I mean, that in my mind could include a couple of things. It may be is making the current designated waters does, you know, to make them even better, or it may be expanding those waters would be enhancing it as well. So there, I say there's this, you know, implicit authority within these broad charges. I think it will, will give you plenty of coverage to, to work in, a, you know, in, in some collateral areas that heretofore you maybe haven't. And, you know, that, but, but as long as they're all, whatever you're doing is all tied back to, you know, enhancing, establishing, designating, protecting blue ribbon fisheries. Drew, you have uh, your hand raised. I do. Uh, Wes Johnson has a question. Marty, can you hear me? I can. Okay. Uh, good to see you again after many years. Yeah, it's been a few years, hasn't it? If uh, we were to use blue ribbon money uh, to get in-stream flows that would benefit the Great Salt Lake in the long run, I'm thinking about the Weaver River, the uh, Provo Canal up by Oakley. If we could get that water put back into the Weaver, use it as a blue ribbon fishery for the middle Weaver, and then the lower Weaver, then it goes into the Great Salt Lake. You're basically killing two birds with one stone there. You're yeah. Water I, I would just advertise your reason for doing it. You know, principal reason is to enhance, to create a blue ribbon fishery. And if there's some incidental benefit of taking, you know, allowing more water to hit the salt, Great Salt Lake, that's great. I just don't get those two mixed up. I just always tie it back to the blue ribbon fishery and then um, kind of the, by the way, this is also going to be beneficial for the Great Salt Lake. Yeah. Okay, good. But you would never acquire a water right just for the Great Salt Lake. That would be clearly outside your authority. Okay. And the divisions and we'd get in trouble with um, our federal partners that give us that money unless they consider it like a habitat project for brain shrimp or something. <laughs> but, uh, well, what else we got? I think that Weaver River example is a really good example. I saw Randy had to take a phone call real quick, so the leadership's probably occupied for one second. <laughs> <laughs> Did 
Does, I mean, does that make much sense? I mean, you, you could probably get into quite a wide array of things as long as you can reasonably tie it back to Blue Ribbon Fisheries and that it's the primary purpose for your action is for that. I say if, if you wanted to come up with ideas on how to protect Blue Ribbon Fisheries from climate change or drought, and uh, it would have to be tied to the Blue Ribbon Fisheries, but it would probably be useful, you know, whatever you came up with elsewhere in the division. Because I don't think your Blue Ribbon Fisheries are going to be impacted disparately by drought or climate change than non-Blue Ribbon Fisheries. They're all going to have impacts to it. So, and that'd be the way to probably keep you safe away from critique and criticism of saying that you guys are, you know, operating outside your authority. Okay, are there any other questions for Marty or Kyle? Thanks, Marty. Thanks, Kyle. Appreciate yeah, thanks, it. Guys. No problem. You're welcome. Thank Randy, you very much. Do you want uh, want me to hang around for the the rest of the meeting, or you want to just call me and I can jump back on if you'll have any more questions? Um, what does the rest of the group think? We're gonna kind of do some discussion time now. Uh, do you think it would be beneficial if Kyle hang out or not? If if we can have access to you, Kyle, I'd I'd hate to tie you up. For we're not sure which way the directions the cut discussion's gonna go, but. If you don't mind jumping back in now and then, if we need a question, at least that's how I'd like to do it. I, I'm open to anything the council would like. I, I'm fortunate enough to have a few folks on here that really know the law well, so that may not be the best advice. My, my opinion is uh, if, if Kyle can hang out, I'm not sure we need both of you, but I, I'm assuming part of this discussion is going to be based on what you just said, what are the latitude? You know, what exactly, and I'm sure it's gonna be situational that might not hurt to have some expertise. I I will probably log off, but I am a bed man. I'm gonna be here in my office. So give me a call if something comes up, you know, I can help out with. I'll uh, be happy to join back on. Okay. Well, awesome. Thank you, Marty. And also thanks, Kyle, right. for, for stay on here. Thank you all. Okay. So I'm calling a little bit of an audible here. I had to step out of my house for a bit of an emergency here. So anyway, I'm going to try to run this here kind of outside. So <laughs> that's uh, kind of making me change up my plans a little bit on the fly here. Um, I originally planned on kind of spending some time here going into basically the six different objectives that are outlined here within the, the Blue Ribbon uh, guidebook and basically use the breakout sessions of maybe uh, probably about four or five people with each group focusing a little bit of time and um, kind of talking about specific strategies. These are things that we can do within Blue Ribbon specifically to um, maybe uh, make some changes to the program considering some of the, the the results that we got back from the data when we did those surveys um given kind of the logistics of me running things i don't think i'm going to be able to do those breakout sessions unfortunately so i think what we're going to do is kind of do this as a big group which isn't ideal but I'll, I'll try my best here to get everyone an opportunity to talk and we'll get these ideas kind of expressed and we'll again kind of summarize them after the meeting and i'll, I'll take some time after this meeting to uh, kind of review the, the YouTube video of the meeting and make sure we have things jot down. I think what I am going to ask is um, I, I've queued uh, Natalie, uh, Nick, and um, Clint to kind of take down some notes of things. Would one of you mind using that Lucid Spark board? It just needs to be one of you to maybe write down some of the ideas that are expressed during this. And then we could go back to that later at the next meeting, consolidate things. Randy, I've already got mine up, so we'll just do that. Okay, awesome. So we'll start from there. And then thank you for doing that, Natalie. I appreciate that. So I believe, can you tell me what the first one is on there, Natalie? It's identified Blue Ribbon Fisheries, right? Another call yeah, that's right. Similar to this. Line. Okay. 
this. Oh yeah, yeah. So uh, these are steel box. Those those so, ones. Are hold on, let's see. I yeah, see if so I can. Sorry, okay. muting Clint there so we don't get all the background noise. Okay. So the first one's identified blue ribbon fisheries. And I, I think what we want to do is maybe spend just a few minutes here kind of talking about what we can do as a council to uh, maybe identify blue ribbon fisheries down the road. We're here, we're talking about specific actions and we're going to run through each of these objectives here and spend a few minutes on each one. So I think what we're kind of sending out is we're open with anyone having any ideas here for changes or we keep doing what we've been doing. It doesn't really matter, but getting some of these ideas jotted down and you know right now we're just in a brainstorming session and like i said we'll probably spend some time at the next meeting consolidating these a little bit and moving on randy this is drew could you repeat that question one more time okay so the first one we've got is identify blue ribbon fisheries what i'm asking for is us to maybe spend a few minutes talking about if there's anything different that we can do as a council in our process of identifying new blue ribbon fisheries and again we're going to kind of go down the list here so examples of this you know this is the only one of the objectives that's related to blue ribbon waters here so examples could be you know reevaluate waters might be something we want to do uh we've talked about this notion of uh you know, if, if everything is special, nothing special. So do we have too many blue ribbon fisheries? Do we need to spend some time maybe looking at that? So that's what I'm kind of looking for in the session is as we go down these different objectives, kind of uh, determining, um, you know, maybe some strategies that we want to employ as a council or maybe things that we've done differently in the past that maybe stay along the lines of this blue ribbon focus, but help us to uh, maybe refine our purpose and might lead to us as we kind of refine our, our guidebook or whatever and what we're doing. Okay, I see a couple of hands up. I know Rex, I see your hand up. Well, Randy, I, I, me, I, I think we're, I've mentioned this before, but I think we're building on the back of a lot of time and effort of people that, you know, starting in 2005, that started going out and taking a look and identifying blue ribbon waters. I know that one of the points that came up was that the DWR should uh, identify blue ribbon waters. I, I, I'm sorry, I don't agree with that. Um, I think what the process that's got us to where we are now, um, maybe we do have one or two too many, I'm not sure. I think we're pretty close on the waters that we have now. I, To me, it looks like we, with the exception of one or two waters up or down, we're probably where we should be for the state of Utah. Um, then, how do we do better with the ones that we finally got identified? Because it's taken years and years of work to get to where we are now. So that's kind of how I feel about it. Okay, thanks Rex. I see, uh, I think Brian was next and then we'll go Drew. Yeah, sure, as, as I read that uh, is executive uh, declaration creating this, uh, a few words jumped out at me or themes. One was the word pristine fisheries. Uh, the word pristine, you know, means uh, clean and fresh as if new, um, not impacted by human civilization, you know, wild, natural, beautiful, <laughs> those sorts of uh, synonyms for pristine. Um, and a similar thing, you know, part of the reason was to draw anglers from surrounding states, from out of state and from in state uh, to those pristine uh, fisheries. Um, so, you know, when I think of pristine and, and kind of not really impacted by, by human interference, you know, you probably get into more of the natural flowing rivers, maybe undammed ones or even dammed ones, I guess. Um, and then it'd be interesting to know the demographics of people that this order intended to draw to the state to spend their money for the economic benefit. Uh, are they are they people that sort of catch and keep and they come here, they, they wanna keep fish and take them back to their state or are they catch and release? So I think there's some, I don't know, I'm probably reading between the line with some of these words, but um, that's kind of my thought is uh, there, there might be more opportunity for 
new or, or identifying blue ribbon waters um, and maybe more streams, a lot flowing off the high Uintas are kind of lumped together, but there's a lot that could be separated out in the high Uinta, in the Uintas north end, the south slope that, you know, maybe, you know, uh, promoted, uh, you know, another part of that executive order was promotion of these things. So, you know, if we want to draw anglers money and, and draw people to these, you know, I think we could do a better job of promoting some of the pristine uh, Uinta sloped waters. Anyway, just a, a comment from my two cents. No, that's a good comment. And I, I appreciate that. I, I did notice you have the word pristine in there, which probably indicates that the original order had a cold water emphasis, I'm going to guess, because I, I think when we stereotype pristine, we're thinking that kind of setting. But, you know, I, I think one thing we do need to look at and just consider a little bit is, you know, there was definitely, I think, some input, particularly coming from the division staff through that part of the survey about making sure that we're reflecting all angling interests in the state. And I think that gets into some of the warm water interests, which maybe don't fit that stereotype of pristine, even though they really do have high quality water and they're excellent fisheries and excellent opportunities. Okay, I think Drew, you may have been next. Yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna try and weave some of the those uh, priorities and things that we discussed as, as, you know, as a group last time that we would like to try and address moving forward and kind of tie it into where I think we're at. Uh, one, I, I think the blue ribbon fisheries uh, that we have identified represent the best fisheries that we have in the state. And, you know, there is a risk somewhere down the road having all of our fisheries be designated blue ribbon fisheries. I'm not saying that's, you know, a bad thing necessarily, but it's something that you might want to think about. Uh, but, you know, uh, where we're at, if we agree that largely we've captured all of the waters that deserve the status of being a blue ribbon fishery, then you tie that to, you know, the issue we discussed last time, which is water. And maybe we look at trying to keep the blue ribbon fisheries that we have wet and, you know, actually start looking at, at the issues we identified, water being the first and figuring out how we maintain uh, these the status of these fisheries through times and what those uh, threats may be and try and address those as best we can and prioritize them uh, on the existing waters. I think that would be probably a, a really good opportunity to do that. I think that's a great idea, Drew. And, um, you know, we, we've kind of talked about this notion of hitching our, our wagons to whatever kind of an emerging issue is and you know, honestly, I think as Kyle and Marty talked about things, it kind of damped my feelings of it with those sideboards. But I think what you're bringing up, though, is an excellent way to do it. And probably doing it through the fisheries themselves is probably the way to, to, to go about that. Okay, I think uh, Dave may be next. We'll go Dave, then TJ, and then Rich. I, I just wanted to make a comment on where I see us going. You know, in the mission statement, it says identify and and it seems like that's what brought this whole discussion on is we've identified all the waters. I, I kind of disagree with that. There's some that uh, go off the list. There's some that are potential coming on the list, but we're, you know, we're close to identifying most waters, but it also says in hand. So, I mean, actually our funds are limited. Uh, the funding we do have isn't a tremendous amount. And there's so many projects within those blue ribbon waters that we can fund like structure in reservoirs like natalie was talking or or uh, solar powered aerators or i mean there's so many things we can do to enhance our blue ribbon waters and then protect those blue ribbon areas i think you know it's in the mission state statement also and then it goes on to say uh for the best angling experience i from what i gathered from marty bushman that he was kind of you know, manipulated into going outside the lines. I, I think we've got boundaries that we have to stay within. And I I really, I don't want to see us go outside them boundaries. I'm all for uh, enhancing our blue, our current blue ribbon waters and making it the best angling experience we can for the fishermen of our state uh, and for sport fish. That's where I'm at. That's all I got to say. Thanks, Dave. 
Okay, we'll go with TJ. <clears throat> well, since we're brainstorming, one thing that came into my mind is do we want to classify our blue ribbon waters in terms of uh, cold water, uh, warm water, and then mixed? So there's been some criticism that in most people's mind, blue ribbon means pristine, you know, flowing streams, trout water type of thing. And that's not how we've identified blue ribbon. We're talking about the quality of the fishery, whether it's warm water or cold water. And I'm just throwing out, maybe we should refine or uh, relabel our lists or split our list into what are mixed fisheries. So uh, folks that want to fish blue ribbon know what they're going to get. Are they at targeting trout? Are they targeting bass? Are they, you know, just throwing something like that out and are we done identifying them all? No, I don't think we have because we've still got what, Navajo and a couple others that move in and out of the list. And I think it's important for us that if a water quality goes down, that we quickly respond and get it off the list so that we maintain the credibility of what is on the list going forward. Those are just a couple thoughts from me. No, those are good thoughts, DJ. And I, I should say, um, if, you, if you look at the list I maintain, at least on my computer, it, it's broken down. So we have some designation here on both warm water and cold water, and also the size of the fishery, and then lakes and streams are separated from one another. So there are some kind of internal designations on these blue ribbon waters. And it, maybe, and we've kind of talked about this in past meetings, whether we need to highlight those more. You know, we've, we've mm -hmm. talked about maybe highlighting the reasons that the water is blue ribbon, and it might be something like this is a, I don't know, a large cold water lake that provides an excellent fishing opportunity for families or something like that. We could, we could come up with better wording than that, but it is something we've talked about. Yeah, Rich. Yes, um, this view may be counter to what a lot of the rest of you are uh, understanding, but I look at the middle Provo as a fishery that has gone down in its quality uh, from a blue ribbon perspective over the last 10 years. A um, couple of examples would be, there's far too many people fishing it, um, meaning the parking lots are impacted. Uh, the restrooms are uh, really pathetic most of the time. And for the average angler, the size of the trout has gone way, way down. Um, so I'm totally in favor of reevaluating some of those special blue ribbon fisheries uh, from the perspective of what is the quality of the experience that we're looking for? How do we take a section like the middle Provo and bring it back to the standards that people in state and out of state are looking at to come and fish it? So anyway, that's that's my spin. No, those are all good points, Rich. And that's something that we've talked about as well in the past is the reevaluation of water. And it's something where as a council, we spent a lot of time kind of identifying new blue ribbon waters. And we spent less time maybe looking into those waters um, it, that have been designated. Because some of those have been on the list now for you're getting pretty close to 20 years. And whether it's time to look at some of those waters again and ask, are they still blue ribbon or not? I suspect a lot of them are because a lot of those fisheries that were initially put on the blue ribbon list were, um, you know, the strawberries and, you know, kind of the, these, these fisheries that have performed really well for a long period of time. But then there's going to be some waters on there that have probably declined in quality. Yeah, and, Larry. And I'm, I'm, I'm not necessarily saying that we need to remove it, but if it's going to be a blue fishery, uh, a blue water fishery, then I really feel that it needs to be brought up to better standards than it currently is. Okay, that sounds good, Rich. Yeah, I mean, we, we could definitely talk about that going down the road. Yeah, Larry, I see your hand up. Yeah, just a couple of thoughts. Um, one, uh, uh, I, I like the word pristine. Uh, and I think that does apply to warm water fisheries. You know, you go down to some of these places in the desert that are warm water fisheries and 
it is a pristine environment just because you're fishing for bass or maybe there's, oh, you don't mean this derogatorily in any sense, you know, there's a lot of gear fishermen down there and, and that kind of stuff. And, and I think, you know, pristine has to me more meaning than just, uh, you know, the cold water fisheries and just to kind of leverage off rich a little bit. I, I interface with a lot of the guides that fish the middle Provo with their clients. And I'm, and I, you know, interface with a lot of the guests here in, in the summit County area and, and, uh, Wasatch County area. And people that come from an urban environment and go fish that middle Provo, the, the experience for them is, is, you know, we're, we're kind of used to that thing. You know, it's, 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 you know, it's world class to those guys. To us, maybe you know, you're hiking up above Smith and Morehouse and fishing the small creeks, and that's a that's a you know a, a, a more I'll use the words pristine uh, environment. So I think we have to maybe look at it in the perspective of you know what what does the angler who's out there fishing these waters what do they think? Because a lot of times you know it's it's a it's a guy and his family out for a weekend, you know, we, we go out to a water and it's like, oh yeah, this is kind of nice, but they're, they're thinking a lot of these are world-class experiences for them. And, and I, I think when you look at the objective from an economic standpoint, particularly along the middle Provo, that that's been a home run. I, there's tremendous number of people making a living out on that, uh, out on that river from an economic standpoint and going into you know, going into Heber or coming into Park City and spending money in the restaurants and in the the, the tackle shops. So that that's just kind of a couple of thoughts I had. Yeah, thanks, Larry. Thanks for those insights there. Yeah, Drew. Yeah, I'll just kind of let you guys know there's there's you know many many fisheries that uh, in this state that if if it was up to us as biologists we'd probably make some changes, but that's why this council is so valuable, or one of the reasons, one of the primary reasons is actually having a, a sounding board that lets us know what anglers want. We do surveys uh, that help us in that regard, but having somebody, you know, to talk through these issues. Uh, you bring up the Provo River and, and Chris uh, Crockett, I, I, I don't know if you want to chime in here, but it seems like uh, the anglers in, in the Provo are fairly satisfied overall in the creel surveys we've done. And there's a lot of guides that, you know, uh, their livelihood depends on people catching fish. And I mean, we've kind of talked to anglers through time and, you know, one of the better things you could do is remove some fish and get some bigger fish if we were all into catching bigger fish. But, you know, we have to appreciate that, you know, there's different wants and needs out there. And that's where, you know, us as biologists probably need more help than not. Uh, Chris, do you have anything? I'd probably need about a week to really talk about the Provo, Drew. <laughs> um, and maybe not to get too much in the weeds on this one, because I, I, I joined this conversation late, but I, I doubt the main intent is to talk about the Provo. Um, so I don't want to take up too much time, but Drew's right. It just depends on what the anglers want. And we went through, we went through this very process a couple of years ago with the Provo river. There were some people that were outspoken that it had tanked and we ran all our PSD data. We looked at historical data and we kind of took that show on the road and presented that to blue ribbon and many of the, TU groups, and really the take-home message was that the Provo is still doing great. I mean, we've got a true brown trout trophy fishery. Um, it's a true whitefish trophy fishery, and we still do have a lot of those 8 to 12-inch fish. So it really does just depend on what people want. But without getting into that too much, you know, this could be something to discuss at another meeting specific to the Provo. And it might also just kind of be worthwhile realizing what we've already done. So we're not reevaluating a water every single year, if nothing has really changed. Yeah, I think you're definitely right, Chris. So th thanks for your insight on the Provo. And 
you know, you're right. You know, I, I think we need probably some reevaluation schedule, but the, you know, we need some cutoffs and sideboards on what that looks like because we can't reevaluate everything annually. Okay, so a couple hands go up. I think we'll go Clint and then Drew. So Randy, I was trying to get ready for the little breakout sessions and thinking of how fast seven minutes goes when I'm presenting. Um, here's what I've kind of taken from this. I think we need to maybe look at our reevaluation process, and we've talked about that in the past, and not stepping on anybody's toes, but I know at least for me in the region here, unless somebody gives me something outstanding or something changes dramatically, I think as a region, and, and Penny and I have talked about this, we're kind of done identifying new, new ones, and we're moving on to this, all right, let's make Pineview or Willard or East Canyon or you know, something like that. Let's just make them better and make better improvements and allow more opportunities um, and stabilize our populations and allow the fishing to continue being great. That's kind of what I'm taking out of this as far as the help that we can get from Blue Ribbon. Um, and what I see the council playing a part is, you know, as we come to them with projects to make improvements that, you know, they ask us questions and want to know why we're doing this. You know, Natalie presented a bioenergetics um, project that has been happening in the Northeastern region. Super cool, way time intensive and labor intensive to get that done. But now she has the data to come to you and present a project and say, look, I need help and you can fill in the blank, right? And I need this amount of money, you can fill in the blank. And she has the data to back it up. And I think that's that's kind of where I see this is if we're if we're going to go and start doing reevaluations, which I think is probably pretty good to do, and I don't want it to be every year. Um, I think we kind of started talking about every four or five years to go through some of these evaluations and, and places, but um, that's kind of what I'm I'm seeing. And and if we can have the council, you know, help us in in those things, uh, that's that's where I see. Um, the benefit and kind of this change because we were kind of like when I started walking access, I was looking for any and all properties that I could get in. Um, but as time went on, I started looking at better and better ones, trying to get those last few that were really good quality ones. So they'd stay in the program for a long time. Um, and I think we're kind of maybe not all of the, all the lakes and streams um, are in, but at this point, I think we've kind of got the cream of the crop in the program, at least from the way I'm seeing it. That's just, that's just kind of me talking and trying to summarize what I've seen. No, thanks, Clint. I think that's a pretty good summary of what we discussed. And again, you know, we'll kind of refine all these discussions, I think, in the next meeting and kind of take the points that Natalie's writing down and we'll, you know, kind of consolidate them a little bit and kind of build from there. So right now we're really brainstorming. I think what we'll do is we'll go Drew, he's got his hand up, and then we'll kind of call it good for this objective and move on to the next one. Yeah, I wanted to clarify what I said at the beginning, maybe in a different way. Uh, this this last year, this last summer, uh, we had 70, uh, maybe more emergency regulation changes that we put in place because of water issues. And several of those fisheries are blue ribbon fisheries. And my point is, you know, we identified water for a reason and, and I fully appreciate adding new fisheries, but, you know, I, I really urge uh, this discussion to be focused on the threats to our fisheries that are in this program now, and water being one, uh, I would at least have the discussion about water rights in streams that that you know can positively affect the blue ribbon fisheries we have that themselves may not be a blue ribbon fishery, and you know, cate cate I guess categorizing what those threats are and prioritizing them and addressing them. In the future, based on this last year, because I'm not kidding you, uh, we're going through a process where we're actually normalizing our drought actions, not treating them as emergencies. That's where we're going as a division. And this group, the one that I see in this phone call can help us out in that regard, but it takes the right conversation and right appreciation for where we're at. No, I agree, good points, Drew. 
Okay, let's move on to the next objective. Natalie, can you read that one off for us, please? Yep. So providing a source of funding for completing projects on Blue Ribbon Fisheries is the next line item. Okay. So I don't know how much discussion we'll have on this one, but this is about our funding. Is there any discussion that people want to have on that? I think, you know, looking at kind of the survey results, I, I think there was a feeling that the process is working well, but I, I think, you know, if people have any comments on this, you know, we could, you know, get some ideas down for things to consider. I'll kind of throw one out to maybe start things off. And, and that's, you know, I think there was some sentiment coming from the biologist that um, they would like maybe some more feedback on the projects they propose and know maybe a little bit more about the council's perceptions. You know, I think sometimes the, the, the way they find out the council's perceptions is just through a score at the end of the day that we provide with the project. But I think they're looking for a little bit more just feedback on kind of their perceptions from the lens of anglers on that particular project. And that's something, you know, I, I, I kind of mentioned that we're gonna do during the April meeting, but hopefully we can incorporate that a little bit more. Yeah, Rex. Sorry, um, I, I just, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm really grateful for the funding that we do have, but if we start looking at the population growth, are we tied to the licenses? Because well, it seems like we've kind of had the same amount and I know last year we didn't spend it all. And then I'll have a comment on the projects, but I think as we look at our, as a, as the population grows, you know, 2005 versus now, uh, we've got a lot more folks that are going to be using those blue ribbon fisheries. And so it, it, it just so if we had some indication that, hey, this will probably go, that that at least helps us as we evaluate the projects, or maybe we just become more fussy about the projects that we do fund. And secondly, I I, I look at this, I, I most of these projects, by the time they get up and they want our want funding, I the the biologists have thought them through. I just don't remember any projects in the last three or four years that I've been involved with that I thought, well, maybe not. There are some that I've said, okay, this and I think is more important than that one, and that's why I'd like to spend my money there. But I, I again, I just, I find our biologists in this state a remarkable group of people. No, thanks, Rex, for that. And, you know, I think what we've seen over the last couple of years is we've seen the number of projects that are proposed go down, but probably the quality of those projects go up. So we've been in a position where I think we've been more than happy to accept all the projects because we're getting good quality projects proposed our direction. Uh, you, you did kind of bring up the idea of, you know, tying funding to license sales. I think initially the number of dollars that we received was set by the number of licenses that were sold, but there's no nothing in the language that makes it kind of flex as the number of licenses sold change over time. We have talked briefly, at least with the director's office about the prospect of maybe increasing the amount of money for Blue Ribbon. And what that's really tied to is uh, largely this effort that we're talking about right now. So kind of refining and making sure we've got kind of a sharp focus for the future of the Blue Ribbon Program. And then we've talked a lot about the economic survey and showing the economic relevance of Blue Ribbon Fisheries to the state. And definitely after having this conversation, my intention is to work with USU and get that study redone. And I think maybe with those two pieces, it'll put us in a place where maybe we can sit down and have that discussion about funding down the road. But we're not there right now. But I, I think the goal here is to start laying the groundwork where maybe that is a possibility down the road. Yeah, Russ, I see your hand up. Oh, Rex, do you have more to say? I just, I, I just, I, I know this, I was reading my notes from our last meeting and, and I really appreciated that Drew said, hey, I, we have some places that we could find funds that, um, you know, if there was a, a project out there that we, that Blue Ribbon thought was really important. And, and I really appreciated that, Drew. I, I, I didn't get that chance to tell you thanks last time, but thank you. Yeah, thanks, Rex. It's not often I get a compliment, so I appreciate that. <laughs> okay, I know, I think, Russ, you had your hand up. I don't see you right now, so I don't know if you put your hand down or not, but. Yeah, I was just getting ready. Um, I just just to follow up on on the comments and and so forth on particular projects. Um, I do think 
you know, Clint and I talked about this this morning. I need to reach out to him a lot more and, and spend a little time with him, um, even even on a, uh, you know, a drive and, and just looking at different things. And, you know, as we're talking, we're, we're talking about those habitat enhancements now, not not uh, evaluating waters. And, and you know, I, I do enjoy being involved in those kinds of things, obviously, with my work and, and so forth. But... Um, but I need to do better, you know, as a council member in reaching out to him, um, not wasting his time, but but uh, collaborating with him and uh, with other biologists within the region and, uh, you know, work together in, in making it a good project. And then when they go for our next meeting, for example, um, I'll have a better idea. I could speak up even in, and uh, and, and you know, let the council know, hey, th these are the things that were considered, uh, and so forth, and and be a voice uh, other than just Clint, you know, or the region. Yeah, thanks, Russ. Any anybody else have any comments on this one? Okay, that one I think is pretty straightforward. And like I said, I I think the notion of continuing funding in one form or another. You know, and I guess maybe I shouldn't say one form or another, but continuing the funding process that we're continuing doing seem to be widely supported based off the survey results. It seemed like all three groups of people we reached out to seem very appreciative of the funding and the process that we go through and thought that that's a valuable thing and should be carried forward among this council. Okay, let's move on to the third one. Can you read that one for us, Natalie? Yep. It is making recommendations to the DWR regarding the enhancement of fishery habitats. Okay, so I think maybe this kind of bleeds into some of what Russ talked about, and the next couple are very similar, where they're making recommendations to the division with regards to various things. In this case, the thing is fisheries habitat. So we can talk a little bit about the process, um, you know, maybe what we could do as Blue Ribbon to be more involved in maybe habitat efforts or providing recommendations to the division from a, uh, a habitat perspective. I see Drew, your hands up. Yeah, I I bring this up because it's I I was brought it was brought to my attention by some anglers recently and and it it has bearing here so I'll I'll say it uh, I think that that you know through time the Division of Wildlife uh, our staff has uh, not uh, not forced or allowed I guess Blue Ribbon Fisheries members to really uh, be out. There hasn't been that that requirement for Blue Ribbon Fisheries members, so it's been kind of voluntary. And I think we've lapsed on on making sure that that connection that Russ mentioned happens. Uh, you know that 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 those relationships are there, and that you go out and understand. You know, like Clint said, you know exactly what we're doing and the work that it takes to get it done. And I think moving forward, we need to create maybe a checklist uh, for the Blue Ribbon Fisheries members so that they know what's going on, where it's going on, who's doing it, so they can go out and see, you know, stream restoration, reservoir habitat, uh, all of the good things that we're doing, and thereby becoming, I think, more, I don't know if educated is the right word, but more up to speed on exactly what these projects entail. No, those are good points, Drew. And I think, you know, between you and I, we've talked about this a little bit. We've even talked about the notion of having uh, maybe more field tours where we can get Blue Ribbon members out to see on the ground a lot of the work that uh, the, the, the division is doing using Blue Ribbon funding, uh, really maybe with an eye of kind of training and exposing people maybe to the diversity of projects and maybe some of the uh, specific uh, methods, techniques, whatever we're using to carry those things out. So that's definitely something that we have talked about. Um, I see Clint and Larry. I'm not sure who was first. We'll go, I think, maybe Clint, then Larry. Hey, thanks. Um, I could just kind of had an idea that came across. I mean, I think as we work through um, these different reservoirs and rivers and streams, you know, on a yearly basis, sometimes we always have a pretty good feel for what's going on in these fisheries. Um, maybe a bottleneck or or something there. Um, I would maybe have something to be encouraged or or put in a, a an item that you know at least 
like Russ already said, him and I need, we need to spend a couple of days and, and go bum around in a truck, maybe with a rod, maybe with a boat, whatever. But like, I really feel that the members on here, sometimes you come to a body of water, we'll just say Lost Creek, for example, and we have a tour, everybody gets to go fish for the day. Maybe that's the only time that you're there. Um, what I would like to see is that there's some component that you go back and, and revisit on the aspect of looking at habitats that you think would be beneficial. So I have in my mind some things that, and if I could duplicate on a body of water, I would love to do so. Um, but I would like to see if that's something that you guys also feel as a, as a bottleneck or you're on Willard and, and you find that this little foot and a half drop of elevation is beneficial for, you know, catching walleyes one day or a hump or a bump, right? Like we know that Browns like a lot of wood in a river and they'll hide and, and be in deep pools with lots of wood and lots of structure. How do we, you know, my thought is, are you, where you're fishing, are you just fishing the local waters that, that are no, near you? Or are you traveling the state looking at these different bodies of water and then come back? And as I finish a regional report, you can say, hey, by the way, what's the likelihood of, you know, repeating the rock reef project at Willard and doing that again or something like that? I, I just think that, you know, it's, I don't mind being the one spearheading and, and doing some of the work and trying to get some of those things, but I like to hear from the council and maybe have something like that um, show up and see if that's something that you guys would be willing to do um, and, and give us some additional uh, ideas um, more than anything else. No, I think those are great points, Clint. Why don't we go, Larry, and then I kind of like to circle back to Clint's question here. You know, what can we do as a council to maybe help identify and bring maybe information to our biologists about some of these issues, particularly habitat issues? You know, what are those things that we've done that worked really well, what things have not worked really well that, you know, we, we should either do more of or less of? But yeah, we'll Larry here because I know his hand's been up for a while. Yeah, you know, just to touch on a second on what Clint said that, uh, you know, I fish mainly the kind of my home waters here that's more due to a scheduling and, and that kind of thing. Uh, you know, I'm familiar with what's going on around strawberry because high country fly fishers, you know, we do a lot of work in conjunction with, uh, with the uh, uh, division, you know, doing, did restoration this last fall up there on Strawberry River trying to, uh, from time to time. So we have some direction, you know, I, I get in my car, I drive down the middle Provo, I go up to upper Weber, you know, just cause it's, it's convenient for me to, to get in those areas. So if, if there was kind of a list from the biologists of, Hey, these are kind of some target areas, you know, if you get a chance to get up there, we'd sure love some feedback for you. Just a little direction, um, uh, would, be, would be helpful. And then, uh, I, I guess, you know, I'm always happy to uh, go out and help out with things. And even if it's, you know, quite far from home, just a, uh, some more idea of when some things are going on, particularly in the southeast and the southwest portions of the state. So that I could get in the car. I got friends down there I could go fish with and stay with. And, uh, you know, just some direction from from the biologist, because. You guys are the, the the foot soldiers, I guess. You're out there. You know what's going on, and and I'd I'd love some help with that. Okay, thank you, Larry. I think what you're kind of highlighting here is probably this, this two way street that we need to work down. That 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 two way street is, you know, Blue Ribbon providing some feedback on various projects to our division staff. We get the division staff also maybe indicating where they can use those eyes on the ground and maybe a little extra advice. Okay, I'll go Natalie and then we'll circle back to my question about, um, you know, what can we do to help kind of get that information to our biologists more? Just a, a thought, We'd, we have previously done this in conjunction with our regional reports. Um, and it somehow must have gotten dropped off, but we used to do that where we 
talked about projects that were coming up and options for helping on each of our regional reports. So I think it could be as simple as that, just adding that bullet point back into the regional reports every month by the biologist and letting all the members know what is going on that next month coming up, what they can help with, dates. Um, I don't know how it got dropped off, but I do remember doing that in the past. Yeah, thanks, Natalie. Okay, so, yeah, go, go for it, Rex. I, I just, on what Natalie said, I we have a pretty good, I, the Blue Ribbon Group, I, you know, I just have to hit one thing and, and it uh, sends it out to everybody. I know I personally, I wouldn't mind getting a, a couple of notices from the biologists that said, hey, this week we're working on this. I, I can't speak for the others on the on the group, but I, I really would appreciate, hey, this is coming up. And then all you've got to do is reply and go, hey, I can come out for that. And um, or I thought about, well, do I want to become a central clearinghouse, which I'd be more than happy to do. But I think it's pretty quick to just send some out. And, but I don't want to speak for the rest of the folks on the group. But I, I think it'd be kind of nice to know that, hey, this is what we got going this month or this week, I don't want to add you guys schedule. You guys have a busy enough schedule, but you know, I, I think that'd be, if I knew Clint was going to go up, Hey, I'm going to be at Rockport this day. I, then I could just quick reply and go, Hey, I'll be there. Or, or you know, um, just whatever it was. No, I think those are all good points, Rex. And I, I think we've done that to some capacity in the past. You know, I think today during regional reports, we heard some stuff about habitat structures going in and maybe getting some help getting those structures together. But this goes beyond that. And sometimes it is heavy equipment work and things like that. But, you know, knowing opportunities to just witness what's going on, I, I could see where that's beneficial. Is there anything else? Okay, let's let's move on. What's the next one, Natalie? I know it's very similar, but so making recommendations to the DWR regarding the enhancement of access, accessibility, and amenities at Utah Fisheries. Okay, so this is basically the same question as the last one, but we've changed from habitat to what access and amenities. It, do we feel like what was said for habitat applies here? Or are there some additional things? Yeah, Calvin. I think this um, can be considered for both. Um, we've always discussed and always said uh, these regional reports are kind of more have been turned into a fishing forecast or a fishing report than anything during these meetings and maybe changing the format a little bit where it's a more of a dialogue between all council members and the DWR biologists on these issues and not necessarily just talking about fishing reports might get us there. It's just maybe a little more open uh, dialogue during those sessions. Um, Cause I would rather, instead of me telling you how thick the ice is at Joe's Valley, I'd rather hear, you know, someone else's opinion or thought on how how their their trip was or how their access was when they went and came down and fished one of my waters. Yeah, no, I think that's a good idea. And you're right, Calvin. I feel like regional reports have kind of dived into being more fishing reports. And I, I think there's probably some way we could restructure these and use it as kind of a, a a time to get at some of these questions, you know, particularly these advice questions, because there's there's two or three objectives that are very similar that are along these lines. Is there anything else on this one? Yeah, Rex. I I think it'd be great, Cal, if you if you said, hey, I, I could use some feedback on X, Y, and Z waters, uh, you know, that are blue ribbon, if anybody can get down in the next month. So I I, I think that'd be a, a, a great way to change that, those regional reports. I I then we could become more your eyes and ears. So I I'm all for it. Okay, anything else on this one? 
Okay, I'm going to ask a question here for everyone. And that question is, how often should we be meeting as Blue Ribbon? Are we meeting too often? I, I guess is maybe the question I'm going to throw out. Because as we talk about some of these advisory stuff, where we're asking people to go see habitat projects or, you know, potentially during a uh, regional report, a, a biologist making a request that they want somebody to go maybe look at something and provide some, some feedback on it. We're asking for maybe a little bit more homework to come from our Blue Ribbon members. And I, I guess my question is, if we're going to do more homework, would it make sense to maybe back off the number of times we meet each year so we could have some more time available for those kind of other tasks? Yeah, Drew. I, I do think there's there's some issues, not some issues, some opportunities that uh, people have brought up, Luck, Russ, Natalie, Clint, uh, Rex, and it's it's not meeting formally. It's doing a better job of going out and seeing what's going on in the field. And I think that, uh, you know, uh, we need to collect some information internally from our folks and, and uh, use part of the year at least as a as a challenge and an opportunity for the Blue Ribbon Fisheries Council members to go out and see what's been done, see what we have in the works, and then use those meetings. And what that number of formal meetings is, I, I'm not sure, uh, but it, it shouldn't be 12. Uh, and use those to satisfy the needs of the governor's orders that are more formal. Yeah, thank you, Drew. That's something we've talked about, and it likely is a direction you know we might have to go down. So I think if we're going to do some of these field tours or you know have people kind of do these assignments, you know, it probably is going to necessitate giving people time to accomplish those things and maybe backing off a little bit on the meetings. I know the executive order says at least quarterly, um, so you know that that's one sideboard. And I'm not saying we drop a, that much, but you know whether we need to have a little bit of free time to address things. Yeah, Russ. Russ. Yeah, I just agree with, with what he just said, um, but I, I just add, you know, there's going to be times, hopefully, that there are, are some burning issues that uh, we really need to discuss and and will require a, you know, monthly or, you know, more more frequent uh, meeting. Um, but but there's times where, you know, letting a couple of months go by would probably be okay as well. So anyway, just those are my thoughts. Okay, thanks, Russ. Anybody else? On either my question or this overall objective, so this one about angler access and providing advice to the division with regards to it. Okay, yeah, Dave, I see your hand up. You know, I, I don't mind one meeting a month, and I think it's important to, to address the issues that we need and interact with the biologists, but I'd like to see more meetings in the regions. Uh, I don't know if we've had one meeting south of Salt Lake the whole time, well, we've had a few field trips like at Fish Lake, but as far as meetings go, we haven't met anywhere but Salt Lake and North. Yeah, no, that's a good point, Dave. And it's it's definitely something, at least internally, we've talked about is getting out more, moving it around. I think historically they did move it around if you look at maybe the, the original council. So if you go back to, you know, 2004 kind of time frame and, you know, probably getting back into that a little bit more. And that provides us maybe some additional field opportunities as well to, combine meetings with field trips and, you know, kind of accomplish two things at once. Anything else on this one? Yeah, Rex. Hi, uh, Randy, I just, I was, it was kind of funny. I was thinking about this this morning. Um, what's the time schedule on the, uh, on the cabin down at Fish Lake? That was one of the more enjoyable meetings we had uh, Go out in the cold with Nick and and uh, do some uh, lake trout stuff. I I I think it'd be nice to, you know, maybe January have our meeting in down by St. George and let Dave host it. I mean, there are some places we could go. Yeah, definitely. And the status on the cabin Rex, as I heard during the southern region, we had a work plan meeting yesterday that it was either done or like extremely close, like within days of being done. So. It's it's there. So we might be able that we could might have an October meeting at least down at Fish Lake. We already don't have meetings in July and December. So 
Yeah, the cabin would definitely be done by the fall or ready for use by the fall. Um, and we are doing our lake trout netting this year there. I, I thought this was the right year for it, Nick. So yeah, it's uh, for those on the new on the council, that's it's a cold night, but it's an amazing night getting to be out with the biologists and see the fish that are in Fish Lake. Okay, anything else on this one? Yeah, Nick. Yeah, and, and so maybe I should run this by by Drew and Randy first, but but mentioning the cabin, I mean, the division has um, cabins and facilities, and to me, it seems like it would be a reasonable use for Blue Ribbon. They struggle. Everybody likes the idea of going out in the field more and, and traveling more, but we really struggled getting members to our region. We are probably the furthest away, but. No, that uh, has been a struggle. I, I think, sorry, you kind of broke up at least on my end here, Nick, so I might misinterpret your question, but yeah, I think, you know, probably using a cabin for kind of a, a, a blue ribbon kind of purpose as a way to accomplish the business, but also, you know, provide some incentive for people to come down to maybe help out and meet and that kind of thing, I think is fine. Okay, anything else on this one? Okay, Natalie, what's the next one? The next one is making recommendations to the DWR regarding the, poten the protection of blue ribbon fisheries through collaboration with government agencies and private entities. Okay, thank you. So this is the one that, you know, is maybe kind of stuck out as being one where maybe we'd like to work on a little bit more. So this one's about ways that blue ribbon can maybe um, collaborate more with other government agencies or entities and also maybe i think maybe the way to put it is you know kind of stand up for various division actions and areas so so basically support from an angler group for certain uh maybe actions of the division are carried out when uh maybe you know a voice needs to be had at a certain you know governmental level so an example might be supporting a division project in front of a, a, a county commissioner uh, commission meeting or something like that where there needs to be approval made for that project that's that's kind of the example we're giving here and looking for that kind of angler group to provide that voice when we need an angler group to kind of step up and say you know yes as anglers we're supportive of this so any thoughts on this one yeah drew i they learned to keep my mouth shut the uh <laughs> I think in the past we we have you know left it up to the discretion of the members to you know do this at their at their own pace and a lot of times when you do that it kind of lapses as a priority and I think that this needs to be put in the same bucket as the you know the previous discussion where you know in order to be a member there's there's you know some things you do on your off time when you're not meeting uh, and we certainly as a as a division have areas where we're weak uh, or the public opinion of us is less than admirable. And, uh, you know, we can certainly, you know, uh, provide some specific guidance in places and areas where, you know, your advocacy for blue urban fisheries there would be very meaningful and helpful to our ability to actually do our job there. No, good points, Drew. And I, I could say for reference, we've kind of had this conversation a little with the director's office. And I think the suggestion coming from them was, you know, for some of this, this I know could be an uncomfortable issue, but it's it, it's something we could help coach people with. And there might be some avenues that the ribbon members would feel comfortable with where the division could provide some support and advice. So, you know, these could be things like letter writing or there was even some comments of maybe using um, division social media channels and that kind of thing to maybe release some information from Blue Ribbon that in at least some cases when it would be appropriate could kind of go a long ways to maybe addressing some of these issues. It might not be all of it. So we're not necessarily asking people to stand in front of county commission meetings all the time. There might be other ways to accomplish this, but, you know, kind of working with the bounds of what people they're comfortable with to find, you know, a way to advance our cause at least a little bit in this realm. Yeah, Natalie. 
Well, Randy stole most of my thunder on that one, but I just think that it's important to remember that none of these conversations are ever really easy. Um, we have dealt with them in the region and we deal with them probably on a daily basis. I feel like some weeks, uh, hard conversations, they are. But I mean, as a any of the Blue Ribbon members, I think could come to us and ask for advice on how do we talk to this group or should we talk to this group? Um, I feel like a lot of us regional folks do interact with those groups a lot. So don't be afraid to come to us and ask, you know, how do we approach this group or should we not approach this group in this way, whatever. But I just wanted to comment on that. Yeah, thanks, Natalie. And I think the point here is there's a lot of groups that we work with that um, oftentimes, I don't know, you know, they, they don't see things from an angler kind of perspective. And oftentimes from the division, you know, we're kind of feel like one going up against many, you know, maybe a group that has a very different cause than we've got. And, you know, having a, a blue ribbon or some kind of angler group kind of stand up and provide a, a second kind of voice it helps our cause a little bit, if that makes sense. Yeah, Clint. So I don't know. Did you see Russ's comment in the chat? I did not, but I'll, I'll dig it up here. Yeah, so I can, I'll, I'll just read it really quick. He said, I could easily, and it goes back to the last one, I could easily support a meeting, meeting once a month as well, but maybe if the topics or work are light, maybe just a two, quick two or three hour meeting instead of all day, then use busy topic days for what everyone is suggesting, heavy business, work meetings, and reporting. So I thought, I thought that that probably should have just been brought to the attention, so... Nope, I, I totally missed that. Thanks for bringing that up, Clinton. I do think moving forward, I'm not saying we're going to make any decisions in this realm today, but you know, how we do meetings, how we do business, I, I think is probably going to have to change a little bit. But you know, as this plan develops, you know, I, I think we'll figure out what that's going to look like. And I think you know, these conversations we're having right now at least are highlighting some of the elements of things that we want to include in kind of a final plan. Okay, there any other comments? in the realm of this kind of government collaboration, working with other entity angle of things. Okay, is there another one, Natalie? Yep, I think this is the last one. Um, making recommendations to the DWR regarding the publicity and promotion of blue ribbon fisheries. Okay, thank you. So this is the outreach component of things. Um, you know, we've, we've been doing for a number of years, things like fishing seminars in the last, I don't know, year or so, we've kind of added these blue ribbon social media posts. I guess the question here is, is, is there more that we can do? Is what we're doing right now appropriate to address the objective? Is there any changes we want to make to how we do business here? This is an area that we do put a fair bit of effort into already. Okay, I think that's that's easy enough. So I think, you know, probably we'll, we'll, we'll work something into, you know, kind of a final plan, so to speak, but it may very well be kind of what we've been doing, which, you know, has been effective. We've been in good hands with the outreach end of things for a number of years, and that's been a good thing. Okay, does anyone have anything else they want to bring up as part of this conversation? Yeah, Mickey. Yeah, uh, do you have more of those bingo cards? Every time I give a talk about Blue Ribbon, I take those bingo cards, and it's surprising how many people have responded to it and, and have taken the challenge of, yeah, I can go you know, a few more places, but I'm out now. I need some more if I can get more. Yeah, I'll look into it. If if we need to print more, we can certainly print more, though. I know those have been kind of a hit, so we'll we'll work on getting you some more, Mickey. Thank you. Okay, anything else? Okay, that sounds good. I, I appreciate the conversation. I appreciate everyone's insights, and I know I kind of had to pull an audible on how we uh, kind of ran things here, so it didn't necessarily work out how I was hoping to, but I, I think we still had a, a good conversation and we got a bunch of good ideas collected here. 
Um, we're not going to continue this conversation in March because the March meeting is the joint meeting with Habitat Council. So that's already a, a, a full day of stuff we need to do, but we will continue this conversation in April. What I'd like to do with the April meeting is really take a lot of the comments that came out today. I know Natalie's been writing them down and start kind of finding commonalities among these. So what I'll probably present in the next meeting is a consolidated list of things, and we'll start organizing this list of things into maybe a plan. You know, do we need to redo our objectives or do we keep the same objectives we have? What are the strategies that we're going to carry out as a council? But anyway, start taking these and kind of moving forward and using them as a launching board to kind of restructure how we're doing things to make sure, again, that we're as effective as possible as a council and we're addressing those objectives and we're, you know, kind of serving that role where we're trying to meet some of the deficiencies that we talked about through the survey, but also trying to be the best we can to help advise the division and provide that that maximum impact that Blue Ribbon can for anglers throughout the state. Anybody have anything else? Okay, I'll turn it back over to you, Rex. I don't know what's left on the agenda here, but we could close out the meeting here. Thank you, everyone. I think, Randy, that we have, we we did Pineview already, so I think that we're I'm pretty much at the end of the agenda. Uh, we've changed, uh, please note the next meeting's on the 23rd, and then April 21st, um, then we'll be back at, uh, back either online or hopefully by then maybe we can actually meet in person again and then our may meeting is on the 19th and uh i i certainly am uh i think it'd be great to be able to have some of these meetings out in the field that's my my personal feeling on it is that that's a, a great way to get to interact with these biologists that we have the privilege to be with and and uh I maybe help accomplish some of this stuff. I, you know, if uh, Clint's got things for us to put together up at Rockport by then, maybe we go put things together and then have some discussion from there. I, I have to admit, my uh, on our sixth thing, I, I think that was making recommendations, DWR government in private. Uh, I, I, I know while the years I've been on the council, I, my apologies, Drew. I. I, I think that's one place where we really have fallen down, and and I, I'd like to be more aware of it because, I, me personally, I really have no problem going and talking to our elected officials. In fact, sometimes I'd like to go stand them in the corner for a minute so I can give them a timeout. So I won't have any problem, Drew, if you ask me to go somewhere and talk to somebody. Okay, that sounds good. So, thanks, thanks for running through that that schedule there, Rex. Um, again, you know, March meeting is going to be at that that Farmington uh, Nature Center. So, what the Eccles Wildlife Education Center in Farmington. We'll plan on doing April, I think, probably in person. We'll watch the COVID situation, but it seems like it's tamping down and we're starting to head kind of back that direction again. So, I think tentatively we'll plan on doing April in person. We'll probably do that one in Salt Lake because we want to continue these conversations. But I, I really do think after that, you know, we should probably be looking at, you know, incorporating some of the suggestions coming from this meeting and maybe looking for some opportunities as kind of spring and summer come around to maybe get out in the field a little bit. Huh. Does anyone have anything else? Okay. Thank you all. I, yeah. I don't have anything else. Does anybody else? No, thank you all. To, thank you. I put it in the chat. I thought today's conversations and recommendations were, were really solid and appreciated them all so thank you guys thank you for your time drew and it's always appreciated when you're willing to sit in with us okay well thanks everyone for a good meeting today all right thank you all i've yeah, got thanks. to go to the beach <laughs> <laughs> sorry i had to get that in <laughs>